Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Thank you for tuning in to yet again another fantastic indie comic interview. It is your Cape Crusader, Cody, and we are keeping it geekly with our brand new friend, JL Johnson Jr. We're here to break down his awesome, awesome comic, any Ed, The Rule of Nine, an epic trade paperback. This is gonna be covering issues one through seven. We're gonna just be breaking uh, breaking everything down in between the world building, the magic system, and man, there's so much to go over. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today, man? Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm, I'm happy to be on with you. I know we had to uh, push this back a few weeks ago, and I'm, I'm glad we made it work. Oh, what a crazy day, too. I think I hit you up. I'm like, yo, man, uh, I just woke up from a dad nap. There's a freaking tornado going on. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And oh, then later man. that night, my daughter had her first fever. So it was... Um, Something in something about that day probably wasn't meant to be. You know, it, and, and you know, it's it's perfect because now it's a nice chill Saturday. No tornadoes, no sickness. We have Jay Michael Miller joining us as well on YouTube. Getting geekly on a Saturday, getting geekly every day. Let's go. So, how are you doing? Welcome. What started uh, your journey as a indie comic creator? You know, what what started your your footsteps into this? Well, so there's two ways I can answer that. The first one is super emotional and involves a long story. So I'll just plant a flag and say that back in 20, end of 2015, 2016, uh, I dealt with one of my worst bouts with depression in my life. And it just was at a time that I was already trying to figure out whether or not the path I was on was the right path for me. And, and one thing led to another and I realized I wasn't on the right path. But one of the things that I did almost immediately after I found, I quit my job, found myself with more free time, was I sat down and I started scripting comics. It was almost out of the, out of nowhere. Um, I never, if, if you had asked me probably 12 months before that, hey, you ever think about writing a comic book? I probably would have said no. Um, but it just felt right at the time. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other way, you know, back, uh, I guess we were still technically backstage, you asked me uh, if I was a Star Wars fan. and. I have not watched episode one of Kenobi, and because I'm a new dad, I actually just finished Book of Boba Fett last night, for that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a little behind, but I'll get mm -hmm. there. But the reason why I bring up Star Wars, a good buddy of mine, uh, shout out to Dan, um, we were having we, just these working kind of coffee. Dan Price? <laughs> His name is Dan Colonna, not Dan Price, but I do know oh, Dan. I, I was going to say, Dan shout Price is a Dan Star Wars Price. fan too. <laughs> yeah, he's also an indie comic head. Um, now, this is this is a, a friend uh, from the neighborhood, local guy, mm. and um, we were having these working coffee lunches, right? And we were just sitting down, and he at the time was starting his YouTube page, um, at Dan O'Mac here on Twitter and on YouTube also. Um, and he was, so he was talking about that, and, and I was kind of hinting at the fact that I had been writing short stories and one thing led to another he asked me if he could read one and I let him read one and he thought it was pretty cool and I kind of fell right back into the same space that I was in way back in 2015-16 um, and I started turning this short story that was about this this king which eventually became King Julius uh, I, I turned that into any of the rule of nine so it was a big uh, a big bridge for me you know I, mm -hmm. I, I almost fell off but I fell into that really dark and deep place that I think, unfortunately, most of us have to fall into before we figure out who we are. And down there at the bottom, one of the things that I collected and picked up was this habit of scripting comics. And then you hit fast forward, you know, four or five years later, when I'm trying to really take that next step and just find something to do that I love, you know, I kind of went back to that. I had scripted three comics if, in the year 2016, 17, never really did anything with them, probably because I didn't know how to approach artists. I didn't I didn't know really script formatting. I didn't know anything. So I imagine that all the people I did reach out to back then saw a bunch of garbage and realized, mm -hmm. hey, I can't, I can't hold your hand. <laughs> and yeah. so but, <laughs> they just told me they were busy instead. They're so, probably you know, really kicking themselves well, right now seeing what you put, put out though. They're probably like, damn, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be fair, any of the rule of nine was not all so we could, we could get to this too but those were all more dystopian sci-fi type stories one that i really love and we'll eventually get back to the working title is gene editing um and are you familiar with crispr cas9 technology uh, I, I i don't but i'm i'm, I'm eager to learn so it, it's this it's basically a tech where you can for lack of a better way of explaining it and this is how it was explained to me mm -hmm. and how it's often talked about is imagine the ability to copy and paste the human genome. And so if you don't like something in a certain section, you can literally cut it okay, and then put in something you do like. 
sounds like every cool mutant story and alien story we've ever heard of just got a real grounded origin story, right? And so when I first read it, the idea was, you know, very, very fresh in my mind. And and again, I don't, I must have seen that sometime in the year 2015. And if you look it up now, it's a little bit more popular. Uh, it, it's being trialed certain places around the world. I don't think we can use it yet in the U.S. But long story short, that became the origin story for this comic book known as Gene Editing. And, and that one got pretty far in terms of the plotting and mapping uh, of the story. About three volumes worth of planning for it. Wow. But in terms of scripting, only ever got through the first issue. And I think that was a big part of my problem, right? I was, as someone who had no fan base, no following, I was going to these artists and saying, look at me, I have... You know the next 10 years of your life you want to work and they're like dude no absolutely not <laughs> get out of here who are you <laughs> yeah like write a short story <laughs> and so maybe one day i'll pick that thing back up um i did just give away the origin story though so if you want to get to it first i'm pretty busy right now so go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so i mean like from coming from uh, a background where you didn't write scripts you know what did you do to like learn and get into this motion to get into this momentum of scripting these out you put so much work into that i mean like wow like just the amount of like volumes and, and scripts you came up with like what put you in that mindset you know growing up i always have loved fantasy in particular but just stories and fiction i i can whether it's books now audiobooks um, fan fictions, movies, uh, whatever it is. Like, I've, if there's been a story that has captivated me, I'm always falling, you know, falling head over heels for it. I'm the kind of guy who will watch, you know, the movie Troy. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, you know the movie Troy. I've probably watched Troy 150 times. It's not a groundbreaking movie by any sense, but Brad Pitt looks great with shoulder oh, He's a badass too, and he's amazing. And oh my god, has Achilles, and it just it works for me. And so, and lo and behold, that David Benioff then later on has something to do with Game of Thrones, um, which is another thing that I can watch and read ad nauseum. I've read A Song of Ice and Fire probably four full times um, while we all wait. I'm not someone who rags on George R. R. Martin for taking so long, but I have. You know, I'm, I'm holding off reading the series again until <laughs> I know when, when winter is coming back out. But mm -hmm. I just love story. So I think when I decided to try and apply myself to understanding the technique and the, and the actual craft of script writing, it grafted on pretty nicely to my my love of story. And I've always had, uh, whether it was you know as a school teacher, which I was, or a coach now, I've always had communication at the mm -hmm. heart of what I've done for a living. And so I, I think that somewhere in that mix, you get someone who, um, when they when they actually decide to start writing scripts, feels fairly comfortable when they do it. And I mean, I got to be honest with you. This was something I, I haven't mentioned yet. But um, when I was going through uh, some of your uh, extra world building, uh, when you were breaking down the magic, the way you went about describing it wasn't just like your typical, like, this is what it is. You had like... Say like it was like it's like segments of like a like a, a newspaper or like parchment or like a quote from like somebody within the world describing it and I th I was like dude this is awesome I love that so much I appreciate that and and that so for me that's the kind of as it, it used to be better as a kid right so I, I I'm gonna imagine we're in the same age range um, thirty two yeah, I'm exactly on the nose I'm thirty two <laughs> so you know when we you remember the sound of dial-up internet, right? So you used to go home and watch a show or watch a movie and not really be distracted by a device. You're just watching what you're watching. Maybe you've got a friend over, maybe you get the, the AIM message in the background somewhere, but you're not constantly tapped into the internet. So we used to just watch stories to watch stories and watch TV to watch TV. Now that I have the internet, I'm the type of guy where if you reference something, for example, I just finished watching The Last Kingdom, um, right before I finished the book of Boba Fett a couple of weeks ago. And when they're referencing certain things, I'm like pausing and I'm going to Google. And I'm mm -hmm. not, now I'm like, oh, well, wait a minute. So they just referenced this. Okay, so that ties into the historical. You know, and then blah, you're, blah, blah, then blah. you're so, like, oh, well, I need to read this other part because it ties into this too. <laughs> so like three hours go by and I'm five minutes into the episode that I have to go back to finish. <laughs> and so that's why I've, I've, I've always been someone who loves world building just as much as the stories themselves and so i mentioned this also again i don't know if this was backstage or right when we went live but when i started writing any it, it really I, I 
while I was doing the comic stuff for gene editing over here, what I was also doing was playing around on World Anvil and spending a lot of time on YouTube and just you know looking at D and D campaign hacks and all these different things. And so I was just building this world, and the world was actually called Design Two. Um, design is another taps into another one of my loves. It's more from this idea from one of my uh, favorite German, not my favorite German philosopher, but favorite philosopher who happens to be a German mm -hmm. philosopher by the name of Mark Heidegger. And he talks about the humans as Dasein, which are just beings in time. And so I love the name Dasein, and so I named this planet Dasein too. And um, I was just building it, you know. And and so a lot of the world building that you 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 got a glimpse of mm -hmm. predates any of it as a comic. And that's why there are excerpts from religious texts and from scholars of the times. And because these were all the things that I used to bring flavor to this very flat world of design too, which are now in this very round world of, of Amashik that is the setting for any of the rule of not. So do you think uh, the, you were talking about those beings in time, uh, do they have like any uh, correlation to the transcendence? Uh, the, the users of magic that are able to like uh, put themselves in different periods of time if they're strong enough? You, you, you could say that, um, so that's an, actually an excellent question. I, I love questions like that because what, so when I am building any of the rule of nine, right, I'm doing multiple things. I'm trying to immerse myself in this fantasy world that has really existed in my head for four or five years now. And, and, and I'm trying to invite other people to come to it. That's one level. And then the other level, I'm trying to tell an entertaining story. And then on a third and maybe even fourth level, I am, I am loose. I'm making loose political and philosophical commentary on the world that I exist in, which is what I think all creators do mm -hmm. in one way or another. And so there are certain places where I allow myself to indulge. <laughs> and so when thinking about the transcendence, and if you read the entire piece, which no, no, no harm if you haven't, but I talk about this idea that a novice transcendent can't really control where they end, when they mm -hmm. end up, right? They can go to a place, and the example I use in that article is, say you wanna watch Super Bowl, you know, the next Super Bowl. You can, yeah. you can be above the field, but you might be there before the stadium was built. You might be there when they're breaking ground on the stadium. You might be there in 20 years when the next Super Bowl ends up there. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely some, um, it, the, the way that Heidegger talks about um, being in time, you know, there's three different things that a human has to do to kind of live as, as design. And one of them is uh, to focus on the task at hand. So you could say that a novice transcended um, needs to work on their at, at handedness, right? So they, do, they don't know when they are. They, mm -hmm. they know where they are, but they don't know when they are. And that's very crucial to being design because you have to recognize the context within that we're in your, your, you exist, right? So we were born in a certain era, born in a certain generation, and that shapes how we see the world. Had you and I been born uh, 90 years ago, we probably, worst person, we wouldn't have the internet. But we, would, <laughs> but we wouldn't have been, odds are we grow up in the wrong place in the United States of America. We don't yeah. talk, right? So like in that regard, the context where you're kind of, and he calls it thrown, right? The context where you're thrown into has everything to do with the potential that you have to grow and the potential you have to become. And so, yes, there's all of that is all wow. over that you guys see system, <laughs> and in particular, that branch. So excellent question. You guys see what I mean about like just how in depth this world building gets like, geez, um, we have Dr. Hino. Uh, he wants to know uh, how long you've been working on uh, any it as a whole, uh, this comic as a whole. So so the comic itself after uh, again my, my buddy dan and i were having those those coffee dates where it really turned into um something i had confidence to dive into that was that was we we started those january 2020 and um they lasted until march 2020 because then everybody had to go inside um and so when i had to go inside uh, march april 2020 that was when i said okay well i work at a gym so i couldn't go to work um mm -hmm. and i didn't work from I worked very, very part time over the summer because we could work outside. But here in the Northeast, you know, you're kind of weather dependent. So I didn't work from March until October when we went back inside. Uh, I worked like two hours a week. And so it was it was that time that most of what is known now as any of the rule of nine came to be. But I, I just hinted at with the previous question. I mean, I first learned of the concept of design my sophomore year in college mm -hmm. uh, about the gentleman by the name of Dr. Michael Kogan. 
he was a religious scholar and he is a, more particularly he was a Jewish scholar and he taught I was a philosophy and religion major he taught a bunch of classes that focus on like singular thinkers and so I took a class of his in, in my sophomore year and I took a class every semester there until the end yeah you um, paid attention he, too <laughs> <laughs> so like parts of parts of any it are that old right now mm -hmm. when I was first learning about design I certainly wasn't thinking about transcendence but when I did decide that I wanted a magic system and I wanted these beings that could actually project it was almost by default that I connected it to something that was so intrinsic to to how my life as an adult had been shaped because mm -hmm. um, that that philosophy had a, has a lot to do with how I go through my own life let alone how this transcendence you know, move through realms of existence. So it's such a deep first time, first time I've been asked that. So that's a great question. Yeah, deep <laughs> philosophy. I mean, that's that's the the whole thing about this show. I can't really toot my horn without being able to toot it, right? Um, oh, so, yeah. I mean, you you went from like a dystopian, like gene splicing, uh, like comic to to this. You know, what inspired you to kind of like change it up? Uh, you know, it kind of seems like two different worlds. And, and absolutely. And, and the answer there kind of taps back into what I was going through at the time when I first started writing. So at the time, I'm very much into dystopian worlds. And uh, one of the things that I talked about in my early Kickstarters was the fact that I grew up as a kid. My, my nana used to take me to the picket store, as she called it, convenience store where she would play her numbers. Mm -hmm. And um, they had this it wasn't a comic book store, but they had comic racks like convenience stores used to have. Right. And so I would sit down and while she was playing her numbers. I'm just on the floor trying to read as many books as I can. And I remember <laughs> flipping through them. And, and, you know, my Nana wasn't in a position where she could buy me comic books every every week. And so she she didn't. But um, but she was let me spend enough time in the store to look at them. So as a kid, mm -hmm. I had this affinity for comics. And I used to make these like horizontal um, Sonic the Hedgehog comics on like That's lined so awesome. paper as a kid. Um, <laughs> and so like it was always there. It's like when I, I I'm not surprised that I find myself doing this now. But I certainly had gotten away from it. And when Walking Dead first came out, my younger brother, when it hit Netflix, he was probably way too young to be watching it. But he had just <laughs> watched like the first, like he was like 10. He had just watched the first half of the season. Uh, first season, he came home. He's like, Jeff, we got to watch the rest. And I was like, all right, great. So we binged it. And like I told you, I started Googling about halfway through. And I realized there was a comic book. And so I ordered the first compendium right there. And so when I read that, I was like, oh, my gosh, like, there's so much story here. There's so much yeah. depth to these characters. And so that is, if you look at me sitting on the floor in the comic racks, me picking up The Walking Dead, and then eventually me falling into this space where I needed to feel like myself, they kind of all track pretty nicely. But that's why I started with this dystopian gene bending thing because I'm, I'm in the Walking Dead zone, but I'm still not all the way back to self because my first real love is fantasy. Mm -hmm. Always loved fantasy. And so when I kind of became comfortable enough in my own skin, which, you know, evidently enough, I still was doing that in the beginning of 2020. Um, I, I was, I remember being nervous to tell Dan about this particular story. Um, you know, thinking he's gonna make fun of me, you know? We, we, were, we were talking about Star Wars and I remember mentioning Game of Thrones, which he wasn't really into. And I was like, well, I kind of have this thing <laughs> and um <laughs> i can only imagine like, oh, that you're, he's, he's, he's like eh, that sucks you're like oh crap uh <laughs> but you know here here's arguably the greatest fantasy uh, you know contemporary fantasy work of our lifetime you don't want that how about you read mine <laughs> you know it, it see but he was a, he's a friend and so i felt comfortable doing that and, and mm -hmm. so i think that that's how I, I that's definitely how i how i started where i started because i was very much what can I do that's like The Walking Dead? Because I this is really cool. And, and again, it was more for catharsis at the time than actually trying to write a, write a comic. But when it came time to, again, go back inside for that, that long hibernation that we all had in 2020 where we were trying to figure out what was what, um, I had too much time on my hands and this story was just screaming to get out. So they didn't so, have you doing uh, endless uh, Zoom calls uh, for school? <laughs> well, at the time, I, so I stopped the job that I walked away from was teaching. So I, I haven't been a, I, I did go back for a quick minute, but I haven't been mm -hmm. a classroom teacher since probably 2017. And so, but I have been, uh, but I'm a CrossFit coach and that's what I do. So I did do my Zoom CrossFit classes and my outdoor CrossFit classes during mm -hmm. that time. But again, you're talking 
you know, we, we had a permit to be outside for two hours a day. And then you're talking about one Zoom class and there were six or seven coaches on staff. So my boss had to spread those out. So I yeah. had, had a lot of free time. My wife was, you know, working from home. And so life was, life was odd at the time. And so I said, well, let me just pick this back up. And um, yeah. So, wow, seven issues in two years though? Yeah, so actually, <laughs> um, so book eight is currently being worked on. I'm, I'm honing the script of book nine right now. But, <laughs> what, <laughs> but books 10 and 11 are done also. 10 and 11 used to be eight and nine and I moved them. Um, uh, with something else we can talk about, but the story has grown so much. So I did have to add two more. But when I first sat down, there were there were 10, 10 issues uh, of a comic that were done um, mm -hmm. when I broke it up. When I wrote this down, though, I wrote it down and it was about 250 comic book like script pages. Wow. And um, I then chunked those again because I couldn't, I was trying to get people to read the thing. And, mm -hmm. and, and in my mind, it was always a thick graphic novel. Um, but then knowing, figuring out the, the the realities of creating it and getting people to read it, and edit it, and, and do all those things, it just had to be broken up into chunks. So, um, yeah, there's there's technically um, about I guess it would be about ninety pages left of that original uh, original drafting mm -hmm. um, yet to be created. So, so yeah. What was Dan's uh, initial reaction? I know you were hesitant on letting him read, uh, but what did he say, like his first thoughts? So he read a scene that um, has yet to make it into, um, make it back into any of the Rule of Nine. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a scene that involves King Ulysses, and I won't say anything about that because it still might make it in. But currently it's it's on the cutting room floor. And when he read it, he said, dude, this is great. I found I was I was very uh, I remember him, you know, just being very engaged by the character and by the conflict that the character mm -hmm. was in. And that actually was an adaptation of one of my earlier comics. There was this event that took place on a bridge um, and this was in a, this sci fi world and and there was an ambush. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's all I'll say. But the character who one of the characters who survives the ambush um, is the character that ultimately tells the story that Dan read. Uh, whether or not that's, that's awesome. Julius is, you know, maybe one day we'll see. But ultimately, um, yeah, he was so he, he was engaged by the conflict and, and mm -hmm. the setting, you know, wasn't really his thing. But and the, 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 the honest, now that you're asking, I'm looking back, maybe the reason why he was so engaged in the conflict was because it was this sci fi story that was transformed into a fantasy setting. Um, so maybe I had the right beats for him. I don't know, but he, he, he was into it and he asked me to send him more. Um, <laughs> what he didn't know at the time, is I didn't have a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. So him asking for more, I went back into my notes and I went back into the notes for design too. And I started saying, okay, well, if he wants to read more, let me come mm -hmm. up with some more. Um, and if you look, I use an app called Bear to do my writing. And if you look in, in the archive section, there's a lot of the things that Dan read in that archive section that aren't even in the book anymore. Uh, but yeah, it was just him showing interest, honestly. That, that that's is so cool. cool. Yeah, yeah. It's it's crazy just like what like will turn into motivation and like push you to, to, to see the product finish. And, man, I got two burning questions and I'm trying to figure out which which is the most appropriate to ask first. Um, ask let's, Bullet. Yeah, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to. Um, so I know you said uh, you were pretty OCD with things. So I wanted to kind of break into your your creation process and, and take a look at what that looks like. But I also wanted to touch base on you as a teacher too, because um, you, you, even though you quit your position as a teacher, you're still a teacher. Um, Cause I've seen you on Instagram. I've seen you uh, in your sub stack and on Twitter, you are like one of the creators that are out there trying to help other creators uh, with uh, just, uh, pieces of advice uh in, in in invoking questions just all that maybe we'll save that for the end of this because i think we could really capitalize on that as well so let's go back into the ocd uh creation process so there and they're actually not as disconnected as one might think so uh, but i will I'll, I'll steer clear of the second question as much as i can although now that i've heard it i'll probably <laughs> inherit, i'll probably answer a little bit of it but the the one of the things that is really important to me is creating hooks and i this concept of creating hooks is one that i learned and it's something i've talked about recently on instagram um i learned it uh through backwards mapping a lesson plan 
And so, it, and I taught early childhood. So I'm teaching foundational skills. So if by the end of this unit, I want children to have the high concept of addition as something that they can explain as one group plus another group equals a brand new group or however I decided to word it. I'm going to then backwards map from that idea to the first lesson and I'm going to leave hooks every time. And so the way a hook works when you're going forward in a lesson, I'm going to say something at a, a pivotal moment in the lesson. And then I'm going to make sure it's in the work that we do together when I check in with a student one to one. And then I'm going to make sure it's in the check for understanding whether that's homework or the individual assignment. And now that I've ingrained that hook in their mind, I'm going to move it to the next lesson. I'm going to use it in the next lesson, whether as a launching point, another check for understanding or something else. Right. So um, that concept of backwards mapping a lesson plan also works in a story. So um, something that is in the end of issue one, which I know we'll touch on here um, in a bit, Anatu has to leave the city of Dunport almost immediately in order mm -hmm. for the story to really follow him. I didn't want him to get stuck in the city of Dunport because, you know, if you read the stuff on Substack, there's a lot going on in the city of Dunport and I didn't want to get bogged down info dumping my fantasy world. Yeah. Anatu is meant to be a wanderer. He himself is running from something, not necessarily something physical, but he he's uncomfortable. He's not at ease. So he's trying to find that ease. So he had mm -hmm. to leave. So knowing that he has to leave, something has to happen in order for him to do that. So you go back to the scene prior. Well, he's not going to stay at the inn. Okay, well, why isn't he going to stay at the inn? Well, when he arrived to the inn, he immediately gets into a tussle in the inn. Well, why did he immediately get into a tussle at the inn? Well, he met someone on the dock or someone on the dock um, saw him that had a particular, um, you know, uh, uh, set of beliefs that you know may have led to the encounter that looked kind of innocent mm -hmm. uh, may have led to that encounter in the end and that's something that you know i kind of leave up in the air for now you know why did he get into this tussle but really from a, a an ocd and, and narrative perspective he had to leave import and so he walks into the city and it's a brand new city and I do my info dumping thing and, and I show you how pretty the, the hills are and I show you what it's like, you know, in the inn and I share that you can't carry weapons, you know, when you're inside uh, establishments in the city of Dunport, which is why he had to check his weapons. Mm -hmm. I could do all those things, but then I could just keep doing those things and I could keep talking to you about all the different types of people, how the economy works. So rather than do that, he had to do something that was going to spur him to leave because again, he's looking for peace. And the second he was forced to act, it was going to become clear who he was and where he was from. And those rumors were going to spread. And so he had to go. And so that that's how that I and it kind of still answers both of those questions. But mm -hmm. staying away from the teaching bit, that's one of my processes. So uh, I was just talking to somebody else today. You know, I'm often because I can be so captivated in what I'm working on. I'm often just writing down random thoughts. Uh, you know, X, X character can do Y thing. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily know when they're going to do it, but it's something that's really captivating to me. And I just put it in my notes. You, and you uh, do that on your phone or you got like a little uh, little book uh, that you I, jot down? So their app um, works across iOS devices. And so if I'm in front of my computer, I'll drop it in there. If I'm on my phone, I'll drop it in there. And then the magic of the cloud puts it all together. Um, and so I have a bunch of random ideas that they sound like they fit the character, but not necessarily where that character is. But I don't mm -hmm. let myself get concerned with that. Because again, if I want to get my character there, well now I can create hooks and I can move backwards to where the story currently is. And if and if it ends up working out, you know, narratively and, and in terms of that character's arc and progression, then I'll eventually get them there. Or I'll get them to a point that looks like that and that'll be a cool pivot point. Mm -hmm. um, and something like that happens with Anatu later where what he does at the beginning of arc two to the end of arc two has probably ch changed three or four times, but he still ends up in the same place. Uh, and so the, 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 the constant, I, I try to grab every thought possible and I don't let any, let it, any ideas go. Even if I end up not using them, I mean, what's it hurt to have it sitting in a, yeah, in a drive yeah. somewhere. It sounds like uh, your experiences as, as a teacher, like 
effectively made you like a master of like foreshadowing is kind of what I was picking up on. Uh, just the, the backwards mapping and everything. It's it's pretty it's pretty like immersive just to kind of sit down and think about it. Now, how do you kind of check yourself to make sure you're not dumping too much like exposition or too much dialogue in certain panels? Um, and thank you for the, the compliment there. Let's let's see. Let's see if you know I have unfortunately the process of indie comic creation is so slow, right? I, I'm moving very fast in relation to the norm and, and shout out to my team, Luke Horsman, Apple Nunez, Ed Lively, Martin Neal, and now Trent Rommel. Um, I haven't spoken to Trent, so I don't know if it's Rommel or Rommel, but I'm going with Rommel until he corrects me. <laughs> um, we've only talked online, but you know, they, the, the folks that I've worked with, the artists I've worked with have been phenomenal and they've, mm -hmm slowly but surely I, I hope falling in love with the world themselves so that helps the speed at which i'm creating but that aside um you know i, I think one of the things about the the foreshadowing and, and and the ability to use the backwards mapping it gives me an opportunity to let the story kind of develop on simmer right like you know the key to making a really good sauce is letting it simmer mm -hmm. and so um that is not I always break sauces. I'm not good at that, <laughs> but I try. <laughs> but I try. Um, but that that being said, in you know, in, in total Jeff fashion, I'm, I, I feel like I'm losing the the heart of your question. So let me finish this thought and then ask it again. But this idea of just you know uh, letting the world simmer and, and settle, I think will will impact how well some of the bits that I've tried to foreshadow because I have tried to foreshadow a bit already but we're too early in the story for that that happened what was the mm -hmm. original question you asked i'm sorry I did uh talk. just like <laughs> how, how you uh how, how do you uh check yourself how do you keep yourself from dumping too much like exposition and dialogue <laughs> like i just did there i asked you to repeat your question <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and and i recognize that i'm capable of making mistakes and so right around the time i want to say i had just finished my second kickstarter and i had this idea that there was going to be this companion set of stories that would run tangentially with the main story but take on new character and i was like way out there mm -hmm. um and i said you know what i don't need to do this the story isn't as as developed as it feels like it is in my head no one has read this yet so slow down and figure it out and so i hired an editor uh and, and um, they have been phenomenal and um i i i hesitate to to shout out my editor because um two major reasons one uh, unlike the artists who i know are always looking for more work because most of them do art full time mm -hmm. i haven't really run it by my editor if they want more editing work um i'll tag them uh, on, on twitter they're fairly active on twitter and i've shouted them out occasionally they're credited on my sub stack they're credited in, in my book as well but i, I always hesitate with that I, I have to run that by them um but that said, when I, I've been working with them now for probably probably about a, you know eight to twelve months, mm -hmm. and when I when I went to them initially, what I said was, I don't know that I need too many script edits or line edits because a lot of what I'm sharing with you is already out in the world. But could you do me a favor and let me know if I'm paying off my promises? And so they they read you know at the time book three I think was the last book that was in comic book form but they read from one to seven with the idea of looking to see if i was laying the groundwork the way i thought i had laid it mm -hmm. and so they helped me with that so one of the ways that i make sure i'm not doing too much is working with an editor they they help me to really um just focus you know and that can be very difficult for any writer i think especially any writer who's playing around in fantasy it's hard yeah. to focus because you have so many things in the background like the magic that i, I wanted you to read that so i wanted to talk to someone about it but um but that's really nowhere to be found in mm -hmm. the story just yet it's hint the, the, the powers of the transcendence are hinted at in book four um as well as um this is as well as another uh, almost um aberration of that magic mm -hmm. to, to use to use a very particular and specific word uh there is, is also the visible in book four and five um but i really had and then in book six you, you get a real good glimpse of the powers that an aurora has um but it's just like which they sound like it, the badasses like true truly <laughs> i mean the transcendents are awesome like that if i could be one that that's i would be a master of that 
But uh, if you're out on a br bright, sunny day, it seems like you're just like God. <laughs> yeah, pretty, pretty much. And so, and, you know, we could we could go there, you know, and, and for fear of, um, you know, making sure. So uh, did I answer your question enough there? I think mm -hmm. it, it yeah. really it boils down to working with an editor. I mean, that is that has changed my confidence level um, a lot because now I know even if I get too info dumpy on the page, they're going to be right there to say, hey, trim back it up. Um, and so that 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 changed the game from, from mm -hmm. that perspective. But it also was what led me to realize, well, wait a minute, there's so much here that I could play with in a fun way that isn't like these last two posts is one of the reasons I, why I was so excited about them is because I get to play in that world building without like, yeah, it's info dumpy, but not really because there's still so much more about those magic systems that I have to share. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if we want to, I don't know if you're interested in pivoting there, but the Aurora's. So, um, what, what I was going to do is, um, since magic's not brought up in issue one, I was going to break down issue one. And then after that, I wanted to dive into sure. the magic. So that way, you know what I mean? It was sure. kind of still like in momentum. So yeah. perfect pivot. Let's sure. go ahead and just start breaking down issue one. And then uh, we'll dive into the magic after that. So real quick, we have uh, Red Sea Comics saying, one of my favorite creators out there. Welcome to the stream, Red Sea. How are you doing? What's going on? I I'm, I'm going to imagine that that's my, my guy, Chris. Shout out, shout out, Chris. Uh, Unless somebody else is on there on the team that I don't know about, and if so, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so we are looking at Ennead, uh, the Rule of Nine, issue number one, not too far from home. I also love how the title's thrown in uh, uh, some of the dialogue as well. They keep saying the, uh, they're they're uh, far from home or not too far from I'm, home. I'm I'm corny like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading it. I was like, ah, there's a title. Uh, so real quick, what is the Rule of Nine? You know, what, let's break it because this is brought up within the the issue as well. Mm -hmm. So the rule of nine is one of the things that I built in design to. And, and, and so as someone who is well aware of America's flaws, uh, I still have a fondness for our, our constitution. And, and dare I say, the idea put forth by our founding fathers. I know it's not popular to say anything nice about them in 2022, and I, I get that, um, you know. But without touching that hot plate to turn back to what they did, just from a, uh, a political perspective, they looked to the past, they looked to the roman republics they looked at what was going on in europe and they wanted to come up with this flexible and malleable idea that yes would keep them in power of course not many people who are in power figure out cool ways to give it up um, which is one of the things that i try to battle in any of the rule of nine mm -hmm. but what the rule of nine is it's almost as though the nine founding houses and i'll dive into this in a second who, who created the Republic Kingdom of Athea were doing the same thing that our founders were doing. So they were looking at what was wrong in al -Mashik. And what was wrong in al -Mashik from their perspective, namely from Athenia Shadun, who is Queen Alaria's grandmother, um, who was the first ruler of, and, and I'll get into this idea of Republic Kingdom, um, mm -hmm. which is kind of an oxymoron, but um, just planting all these flags again this is my backwards mapping in effect when i'm talking yeah right? the foundation Just making sure making sure that i get back to what you asked but while sharing as much as i can mm -hmm. so imagine these nine nobles and while i have a lot in my story committed to memory i do not have all of their names because the houses have changed a bit in the three generations <laughs> since this um this, there has been some espionage and betrayal there that i that i do hint at somewhere on the subset um so Athenia Shadun leads these nine noble houses to um, to Fremont, where mm -hmm. they are they are deciding whether or not they're going to go through with seceding from the Debashi Empire. And when they do, they need a document. They need a contract to unify them. And really, this is a contract much like the one that started the United States of America that really had little to do with the folks who weren't in the room. Right. This was their way of saying, look, we're going to do this thing and we will do right by the people as best we can. But this needs to be done. And as some of the most wealthy individuals in what at the time was just the eastern half of the Debashi Empire were tired of the emperor. They were tired of the ruling family. Um, and so they wrote the Rule of Nine. And so what the Rule of Nine is, it's a, it's a, it's a living document that states that uh, the Republic Kingdom of Athea will be ruled by nine noble houses that uh group of nine chose a monarch from among them pretty much someone to have veto power so mm -hmm. that's why there's nine of them so the monarch that they chose was Athenia Shadun. and so when they when when they wrote the rule of nine they didn't want it to turn into just a fancier empire so what they said was that after three generations 
the rule of nine and uh, the rule of nine states that the entity it has to um, disentangle itself upon the death of the third generation monarch so when the third generation monarch dies they all have to give up power there's a three-month period where um, you know there's uh, not necessarily anarchy but it could turn into anarchy um, mm -hmm. because what ends up happening is now the people have to vote from among uh, from among themselves who to send back to Fremont right and this and, and this is a process that may or may not that, happen uh, in each of the like the, the the nine places like each among they're, themselves they're, they're doing it from all across the republic kingdom so there are more than nine provinces so now yeah that sounds like war is, it could be war or it could be a nice <laughs> so where are we at gathering. are we are we in this third generation then with this issue we're in so we're in the third generation so queen alaria is the head of the, she is the queen. The power flows through her. It was her mother before her and then her grandmother before her who have been the true monarchs of the kingdom, the Republic Kingdom of Athea. And this is where you get the Republic Kingdom bit, right? They, It is a republic. It is, uh, you know, an oligarchical republic, so mm -hmm. to speak. Um, you have these nine noble houses that pretty much make the rules for everybody else. But they knew better than to say, well, hey, there's, a, there's nine of us we could fight forever and we could argue about every little decision or when we disagree we can just look to you know the the, the monarch here which in this case has always been a uh, shadoon woman um i I don't, I don't know if i'm going to be impacted here but it seems like it's storming outside of my computer it's doing some weird things so if you um lose, i i've more. been i've been hearing you loud and clear uh there's uh the webcam okay. has been stuttering a little bit but nothing like too severe but uh, we've been recording okay. loud and clear Cool. All right. So to, to jump back in, um, that, that power has always flowed through there. So now we are in this third generation, but now we're in a unique space because the founders of Athea, again, they, they created that Republic Kingdom. So there was always this veto power. They never really thought that the war of separation from the empire would last this long. Um, they, they, they had a lot of reasons for thinking that. And I won't get too info dumpy now to tell you why, but they had a lot of reasons for assuming that eventually this thing would die down. Um, it hasn't. And so now Alari is in a situation where they, she and her husband, Julius, either have to end the war and, um, in, in their lifetimes or die knowing that this disentanglement is going to take place when the Republic Kingdom isn't really solidified yet. And so that's one of the major conflicts that I'm playing with. And that was okay. ultimately why I decided to name this story, Any of the Rule of Nine, because how the, the role that the Republic Kingdom of Athea put itself in when smack in the middle of the world of Amashik, it seceded mm -hmm. and changed economies, changed power structures that impacted a lot of nations. Um, and so how, how the Rule of Nine, whether it works or doesn't work, is certainly going to dictate the future in our machine oh that th this is this is insane so <laughs> what drove you to come up with the name the title like the, the the you know the rule of nine like what inspired that that just that seems like a whole podcast within itself <laughs> so quite simply the rule of nine was i mentioned that I, I sometimes let myself indulge the rule of nine is actually a political idea that i used to kick around in college mm -hmm. in my political philosophy classes and they didn't have the fancy name. And again, I wasn't thinking about writing a comic, but I did have this idea about um, a, a much like the, you know, the, the Roman Empire tried to do with its consuls and, and having two of them mm -hmm. who would sit over and lord over the Senate. And, and although, you know, that idea is not really where that started, you had your consuls as really, really kind of just being the, 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 the go-betweens with the people in the Senate, but ultimately because they could, they were the go-betweens, they had the people's ear more than the Senate did, and they rose above. And mm -hmm. So my rule of nine was basically, well, instead of having 50, 100, 500 senators, that gets weird. What if you only had nine? And what if one of them had the end-all, be-all say? Um, okay, that would be cool, but well, then how does that one person not run away? Well, then they need to all give up power at the same time. And so term limits and something I've always been a big believer of you know, in the real world is something that's necessary for government not to get out of control. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote it into this idea that, again, I came in one of my political philosophy classes. No joke. It was something that I came up with back then. And when I was making Dasein 2, um, I flushed it out and I, and I gave it more of a, um, 
more of a, a, a fictional uh, weight to it all. And then so when cool. I sat down to write any of the rule of nine, which again, didn't have that title at the time, this conflict was so different when I first started writing this comic. Mm -hmm. It was so much smaller. Um, but uh, <laughs> but Athea, which at the time was not the Republic Kingdom of Athea, it was just Athea. Um, and they were, it was surrounded by countries with completely different names and all these different things. Mm -hmm. um, they were governed by the rule of nine. And uh, and so a group of nine is known as an Ennead or an Eid or any. I never would have guessed. Oh my God, that's, that is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that's, so nice. Nice, nice and simple there, but it started with the rule of nine. The rule of mm -hmm. nine was really the, and so, but again, as the story grew and I realized because the initial story that I had written was all about Athea, everything else came and went based on how Athea evolved in my story. And I was like, well, if that's how it's playing out in my mind, then that needs to be the name of the book. Mm -hmm. um, because that's, that's because when, when it's all said and done, however many years from now, and you sit back and you read start to finish, you're going to feel that way too. That everything was about Athea and, and, and how Athea broke. And so, um, and I just mean the story broke, not necessarily mm -hmm. it breaking. Um, yeah, so that, that was where the name came from. But like, I, hopefully you recognize that pro the odds that any one of your questions has a short answer are slim to none. That, no, that's fine. That, I mean, that's what the show's about. I mean, I asked cool, like, cool. I asked 10, 20% yeah. of the talk and then you are expected to do 75 to 80% of it. That's, that's how this works. I could cool. ask you literally questions all day long, um, but let's dive into this comic because I feel like we would just be on this cover for the rest of the, the podcast. So right here is the cover <laughs> on issue one. Uh, so what's going on here? What are we looking at here? Uh, we we see um, anonymous uh, that's King, person. That's King Julius in the background, and um, and, and King Julius is um, Queen Alaria's husband. He is the king of the Republic Kingdom of Bithia. Mm -hmm. And so I, I I got some really good advice on where to start this story because initially there's a scene in book two that takes place um, between Queen Alaria and Sir Seligus, who is really the head of her guard. Um, and that was initially going to open the book, but it was a very small scene. It's almost like a a mirror of this scene. So, mm -hmm. uh, but again, and, and it's also a, a friendly duel, not what you'll see in a second, folks, which is a very savage uh, <laughs> action. Um, and so it, it made more sense to start with the savagery, start with the big action scene, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that's King Julius as he's watching, if you want to scroll down. Yeah. If he's that's King Julius as he's watching the men here in the top left, which a lot of people miss, the top left, uh, right above mm -hmm. that tree branch. As those men break and flee the city, King Julius is watching them. So you kind of see that sight line from Julius there on horseback. Okay. Right. Yeah. That's, no, you're right. I did. I didn't even. Oh, that that is so cool. Shout out to yeah. Luke Horsman for that because I said, "Hey, Luke," and this is something else that. Excuse me. And again, it, it, the weather just got pretty poor on my end. So hopefully it doesn't destroy the stream here. But um, that is uh, the testament to just trusting the, the artists that I work with mm -hmm. and really doing my due diligence to find folks who whose work captures the tone of the story I'm trying to tell more so than anything else. That, that is that is the key. There have been a lot of artists that I've come across and, and reached out to and reached mm -hmm. out to me who just tonally I didn't feel like fit the world but Luke um, I think is perfect for it and and one of the things that I said to him was look I'm going to give you a script I'm going to give you these directions so to speak but I really want you to trust your gut and your instinct as someone who knows this medium of storytelling mm -hmm. so when it came time to write the story I said panel one uh, in book one is I want the cover to come from that that's so cool. Just do do what you want to do, and that was what he did. <laughs> yeah, I really like this too. Uh, you know, we got the bird hidden right in the branch. One of the biggest things I really enjoyed too was the fact that the lettering was white and the bubble was black. I felt like reading wise, um, because there was there was a there was uh, some reading to it, but it was not like reading. I don't know what it is like with a white out bubble bubble in the black text. It just seems like it's so much more when it's white. It just feels like it's so much easier to read. Is there any like science behind that? So that's again, you have to ask Luke. That is Luke. The reason why the letters are white and the bubbles are black is because of Luke. Um, and again, like I'm not a micromanager on anything that I do. Mm -hmm. 
And when he first when he first showed me this page, I remember being taken back by it, but I thought it was so cool. And you know, if you ask him, the only reason why he did it was because it shows up better on the black and white because we weren't going to color this book. And so, funny thing, I, I all the shorter <laughs> books, so books three, four, and six are shorter. And they're mm -hmm. stories that take place from outside of the main narrative for now, and that's why they're shorter for now. They will get longer with time as those characters become, um, uh, and, and their storylines become more relevant to the story that we know, and they will ultimately. Um, but for now, they're just short little introductions of them. But uh, I took, I, I lettered those from Jump, um, really just because I wanted to, something I wanted to eventually do was take over the lettering for the whole project. So I, in book seven, I lettered over Luke's art for the first time. And I didn't use the exact same grade of black that he used. And he reached out to me and was like, oh, what color do you use? Like, that looks so much better. It shows up. And I was like, I just hit black. <laughs> my, <laughs> my, my screen and setup, my workstation isn't as powerful as yours. I just mm -hmm. hit black. And apparently it's not the black that you hit. Um, so funny that you bring that up because he now actually prefers the black You're, that I you, use. Later how on does that book. feel, though? <laughs> like someone who is your artist for so many books? It, it actually felt really great. I was like, oh, wow. Not only do you like the way that the letters look over your work, you think that I did something that was, you know, in some small way, a step above. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. So, so you said, another uh, one confidence boost moment. issue one, uh, you're able to get it in color now too, correct? Yes. So uh, the entire volume will be colored. Book one, book two, uh, B. Navarro, newest member of the team. I forgot to shout her up before. Um, she is working her way through, through coloring. She, she, I just got my first page, second page in book three last night. Okay. Yeah. And, so... And so yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was gonna say, does, uh, do you uh, does that with, with this originally being meant for you know black and white? Do you guys change the bubbles at all, or does that have no, any conflict we, with colors? We kept it black. <laughs> um, I actually think it still works great. Where we're mm -hmm. gonna keep it keep it as is. All right, so right here uh, we we see some commotion going on. I really love this panel too. The the galloping. Um, shall we follow? Mm -hmm. uh, our men will stop them before they get too far, and then kind of see some good dialogue happening right here uh, between father and son. Um, and and so the, go ahead. Oh, uh, no, you can go ahead. I, I, I was just gonna say you can kind of kind of see where the father. Yeah, yeah I know you uh, were trying to make the king uh, the antagonist of the story, right? That was and the initial, and you, and you were yeah. trying to make him kind of like vile and, and grimy, and I and I, I really got that from him. At, like as a dad myself, I'm like, dude, I would not talk to my kids this way. Like, oh my god, <laughs> this guy is ruthless. You know, he's like, he's pretty much like the only thing uh, you, you, the only thing you should do is not waver and fight. That that's it. Like, oh my god. And so, truth be told, almost 99% of this scene is the exact introductory scene that I wrote. For King Julius when he was the antagonist. It's not mm -hmm. any different. Um, the only difference is now he has two sons, and um, yeah, now he has two sons. Other than that, it's the same, it's the same story. You know, the and, and the pe uh, excuse me, and the people that he slaughters in the next few pages, um, they actually did something wrong. Whereas before he was an invading force mm -hmm. and just murdering people. Um, so, um, which, you know, depending on, in this case, you can't really cut that any other way because he is killing a very specific group of people yeah. who have done something wrong to his people, um, to his, his, his vassals, so to speak. So he's not wrong in that, in that sense, but yeah, the, the, the dialogue here, you know, one of the things that I, so Micah and Udonis, Micah is the son, the older son is in the center of the screen. Udonis is in the far right there. Um, they are they are, are the way that I believe, and, and this is certainly the case with me and my father, any sons kind of develop in relation to fathers that they know. Part of them wants to be everything like them, and part of them wants to be nothing like them. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of the way that I think, you know, parenthood in general might work. And I'm a new dad too. We'll see. I do have a little girl. And, and uh, at the moment, I don't know, you know, I, told, I, I I'm one of the things that I'm very cognizant of is just because, you know, uh, Olive is who she is today doesn't mean she's going to identify that way later. So Olive and I yeah. might have conflicts, you know, you never know. But, um, you know, I, I may have um, you know, lucked out in the sense that I won't have to, because I, I get in these moments now where I realize so many of the things that my dad and I used to bump heads about were because of that 
part of me wanted to be just like him and part of me wanted to be nothing like him. And so that it's a very, I think, uh, unique relationship between father and son. Isn't it? Um, like, parenting and that's is what so they're weird. Doing. Parenting it's is like so, so weird too, um, because like so the beliefs that our parents instilled in us, some of those are not okay. You know, some of those nope. are, you know, some of those are something we don't want to give our children. Uh, you know, nope. I used to get spanked like crazy when I was a kid and like, I don't lay a hand on my children. I, you know, um, I think your, your daughter's uh, too young uh, for any sort of disciplining, but no, I have a nine-year-old, a six-year-old six and uh, a five-year-old <laughs> and they, they go crazy um and i would never spank them like if anything you know sit on the couch or you know i i could tell my daughter i'm disappointed in her and that upsets her enough like at me yeah. as a kid i used to need to get beaten for me to get it through my head i you know it's crazy to think about i i certainly grew up in a family that was not shy about spanking but i was also the goody two-shoes i never got in trouble <laughs> <laughs> i was definitely the black sheep of the family I was, uh... <laughs> yeah I, I, I never got in trouble and when i did get, i got sent to the principal's office once as a kid mm -hmm. one time oh, and God. so like I, I was yeah i was that kid and, and i wasn't necessarily like super respectful all the time i was just really good at breaking the rules no like, you're smart back. you're you're like they're, they're getting spanked i'm not gonna do it yeah. and get caught yeah. <laughs> I, go, I I tell my parents stories sometimes I'm like, wait, what? You did what? I'm like, yeah, you just did that. Yeah, I'm old enough now. That, that was I'm, years ago. I'm free now. I, I can. It, there's a statute of limitations on some of these things. So, <laughs> so but yeah, this talking is... about lessons though, and not to cut you off there, but that that's really what this scene has always been. Yes, it's mm -hmm. Julius. Kind of, it's me setting the stage for who Julius is as a king, or in in this case. You know the king of Athia, um, mm -hmm. but it also says so much about who he is as a father, um, and so that was what this scene was always supposed to be. It was supposed to walk that line um, to show you that um, you know this man is, although he might look to be someone who you think you you, you understand everything there is to understand about him. Um, if you read closely enough, you recognize that there is more there. Um, mm -hmm. And he is he is trying to be a good father. Just so happens that in this context, again, the context that we're thrown into really sets us up for who we're going to become. This is this is what it looks like to be a good father in his mind. Yeah, yeah, and I, I love this. He's pretty much just like you know, are you tired? Are your horses tired? Why aren't you chasing this guy? He's he's getting out of here. We're losing our time. So um, they're they're he's tasking his sons to kill this person. So he he expected his sons to react when he saw when mm -hmm. they saw the people flee, and when they didn't, now he's doing what a lot of parents do. All right, well, if you don't want to do it, let me show you how this should be done because you can't continue to act this way. So mm -hmm. let me show you what you should do in these situations. First thing he does is he runs down a man on his horse. <laughs> so that guy who is standing in, in looks the gorgeous dynamic, too. This yeah. art. It's Luke again, you know, Luke is phenomenal and, I, and I'm so happy that I ended up working with Luke um, because he just adds a whole new dimension. Um, he has this uncanny ability to keep things loose, but then so cleanly defined. It's, it blows my mind every time. Because if you really, if you really bear down on some of these panels, the, 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 the lines are so free. But then you get like that last panel on the page. I mean, that's one of those beautiful images in the first mm -hmm. book. Um, and so, yeah, that that is... Um, a man who we we meet later and you've you've met him mm -hmm. <laughs> um so yeah that that's what this page is all about and then the next page i think you know for me is one of my favorites still that i've oh, right here you know, written yeah because so now what we're doing what i'm trying to do is show you how ruthless julius is and can mm -hmm. be show you what he believes as a father and then also give you a little hint as to the the political structure in athea and in that last few panels where, you know, or excuse me, actually the, the first panel where he says, and again, I have a lot of this committed to memory, but not this, but you two were lucky enough to be born with a good name, one that comes with status, wealth, and a bit of comfort. You can thank your mother for that because the power doesn't flow through Julius. Julius mm -hmm. came to be king um, for a couple of reasons, but you could just chalk it up to saying, you know, military merit is why he was chosen to be Alaria's partner. Because remember, they knew they being the the generations of the Ennead. This is the third generation of the first Ennead. And the first two generations knew that the third generation was going to deal with some type of turmoil. They expected it to be internal, not necessarily external. Um, so when choosing a partner for the third generation monarch, Alaria Shadoon, it had to be strategic. 
And so the plan was always to choose a powerful force in the uh, in the Athenian military. And it just so happened that they landed on Julius. Mm -hmm. And so when he says, you know, you can thank your mother for that because his life has been far from comfort. As you can see in this and later on, he is very comfortable with a sword in hand. You know, that that's how he's made his wares, um, you know, on the front lines for the Republic Kingdom. And so, you know, then he goes on to talk about, you know, yes, your name carries respect and commands it, but you you have to, you know, you have to use that for something. Yeah, you, you have, have to be a vessel of it. Yeah. Yep. And so, you know, the the last, that panel there where uh, Elias is looking at the blood on his blade, um, you know, he still gets a kick out of killing. He's been doing it his whole life. And he is, again, he was written as an antagonist. So like mm -hmm. that, that's there, right? The dialogue is extremely different. Like he did that in the original script. Um, and the people he's killing, again, they're innocent. So right before he kills this last person in front of his son, again, he's just maimed a bunch of people. And now ran him over with the horse. <laughs> yeah. And so the people he just ran over with the horse, now he is walk just going by and, you know, making sure they're 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 finished. And so that see that panel right there is it's one of the oldest panels in the book. This whole page these pages are, but um, you know, he says, you know, my actions won't define your legacies, nor will your mother's. Only your mm -hmm. own can do that. And as he says that, he drives his sword into the back of another man's head and throat like he did previously. And it's not even like he's killing these guys nicely. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah. It's almost, it's, it's almost like stepping on an ant. Um, and again, he was always meant to be the antagonist. And so there are shades of that in, in a lot of the things that he does. So then we arrive to uh, Dunport Docks. Yep. And this is where we meet in Natu. Um, and uh, it's good. so uh, is he, uh, he, he, he reminds me a lot of uh, similarly to, uh, the, you know, the, your appearance a little bit, like with the stretched ears and everything. <laughs> so the stretched ears were certainly from, I, I stretched my ears way back in high school. So those have been a part of my, um, my look for a while. I actually, when I started writing this, I didn't have my locks. I had a set of locks when I was coming out of college that I cut, mm -hmm. um, regretfully. So right before, when I found out my wife was pregnant, I was like, all right, I'm not cutting my hair until it falls out because um, my, my wife is a white woman. And um, I wanted my daughter to recognize um, that both, both parts of her. Um, yeah, and yeah. one of the truest ways that I can express my blackness is with my hair. And so I decided that I was gonna get my locks back. But yeah, absolutely, this, this look for a nod to, although I do have a character that is gonna be a direct stand-in for me, he doesn't come in until uh, volume two. Um, Anatsu isn't that, but there are shades of, uh, sorry about the city noise. No, you're, hey, you're good. <laughs> uh, I've been having uh, sirens on my end too. I've been trying right, to mute cool. them as they come. <laughs> um, I'm not that crafty. I don't know how to do that. Um, I guess just hit mute and shut up, but I struggle with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, that's definitely where Anatsu's uh, look is inspired from for sure. And then uh, he serves as our protagonist uh, of issue one. Is he? Uh, but is he the protagonist for the? the I know you uh, mentioned the queen was kind of like the protagonist. Uh, where does he fall in this? So almost like not almost like, but in the vein of traditional fantasy, there are multiple protagonists, multiple mm -hmm. viewpoints, and that was one of the reasons. One of the main. Another thing I could have cited and looked at as to why I wanted to create any. You know, I all I I see in pictures when I read. So when I read a great epic fantasy. I see it as an, a really big episode, episodic comic book or mm -hmm. episodic television, but sometimes I, I would always imagine it as a comic. And then I read um, comic, the graphic novel versions of A Song of Ice on Fire, and I was like, yeah, this is this is a this could be a thing. Like you could really flush out a com a, an epic fantasy in a comic really well mm -hmm. because you know I could have spent lines of dialogue talking about the ships and the hills, or I could just hire someone who's really really good at illustrating or at illustration and have them just draw it and so now so much now the only words that i'm really responsible for that you see are the words in the balloons but mm -hmm. realistically the, the same i would have described this doc which i i do in one of my short stories i would describe this doc in a very particular flowery way uh, on, on on page in a novel um, but now I don't have to do that because I can just explain it to Luke or whoever I'm working with and make him bring it to life. So, um, yes, he serves as probably a step above all the other protagonists so far as really the, the main driver of your gaze mm -hmm. through any of the rule of nine. But I, I would I would if you ask me, I would say I have probably four major protagonists and not to Kenneth, 
Julius Caesar, Hilaria Shadoon, and Niawi of the Order of the Jade Crest, who we meet in book four for the first time. So what is uh, our protagonist's role, like a little bit of his backstory? Um, and, and so I, I purposely leave a lot of that out, even throughout all of volume one. So I'm gonna, I'll answer that without giving any details that I haven't mm -hmm. given to any in, in books one through seven. But Anatu, when he's getting off this ship, this is his first time in the Republic Kingdom of Athea. I mentioned before that when Athea broke ties with the empire, that radically changed the geopolitical landscape in Amashi. And so one of the things Anatu's homeland, the islands of Kavana did immediately was they they outlawed travel to the Republic Kingdom of Athia, especially for members of the military. Why? Because they still have relations with the Debashi Empire. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that they do, they they are they are the owners of the world's most powerful navy in Amashi. Um, and it really has everything to do with where they are located uh, geologically. You know, they're they're smack in the middle of this world and, and they have just channels where they can really get to anywhere pretty pretty quickly. They're not landlocked anywhere. Um, so they they, they kind of take on the Fire Nation's role in Avatar. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, the simple way to explain it. Um, and so, but they're not necessarily, they don't lord over everybody, but in the way that the Fire Nation can get wherever they want, so can the islands of Kavana. And so they immediately outlaw travel here. So Anatu is coming here because he knows no one from home is going to come looking for him, right? Mm -hmm. And so his role was as a Rokita, and, and Rokita is, um, I use that word because it comes from the um, the language that I created as the mother tongue in Abashik, which is called Nazola. I used a, a, a software that will create a unique language. You put in the rules, the sounds, all these things, and it'll spit a language back out at That you. is awesome. Um, Thank you. So it's one of those. I was wondering, that... <laughs> I was like, not to interrupt, but I was wondering, yeah. like, just because some of these names were just so in depth, and like, I'm like, man, dude, this guy's like a walking encyclopedia. This is the now, secret. I, I say that Tolkien, you know, I say Tolkien was a linguist. I had the internet. That's how I describe it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, no, I, I there's, and that's a whole nother rabbit hole. We can do this again because there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. Um, but um, <laughs> you know, so the uh, Raukita is a, is, it's a hunter. It's, it's mm -hmm. literally a. a it's just the Nazolan and in Kavana they speak a, a derivative of pure Nazola that mixes commons and Nazola. But uh, a Raukita is a hunter and it's a hunter of the uh, in the military sense. So not someone who hunts and gathers, mm -hmm. but someone who does what the uh, Kavanian Navy often does, which is um, imagine if um, the Navy SEALs were an army for hire. And I say that sometimes and people chuckle because they have commentary on the way that our military works. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, imagine folks with the skill level of the Navy SEALs when it comes to their ability to get in and out of a situation. Whatever that target is, whatever the option is, they're some of the best in the world. That's what a, Ra a band of Raukitas is like in the world of Amashik. So if you need a search and rescue, if you need somebody assassinated, if you need you know, anything that has to do with getting in and out unseen and untouched, you can call them. And mm -hmm. so they're, and, and they're, and again, it, it, I'm, I'm stepping over so many rabbit holes that I don't want us to get bogged down in, but one that I can't pass up because it's something that came up elsewhere in my network on the interwebs recently. The ancient um, Mali empire uh, is one of the most, un, one of the most underrepresented um, empires in the, the the era that we know as the middle ages or the medieval, mm -hmm. medieval times however you describe it and so the islands of kavana and the way that they work is kind of modeled after the mali empire but the, the what the mali empire did is they set up trade routes that were impeccable and and so they they were in control of so much of the trade during this time that they got rich off of it yeah. um, well you take that idea and now they they it's not necessarily trade routes but it's military routes it's it's mm -hmm. it's you know, commercial travel runs through waters that they control. And because of the way that they have positioned themselves as a Navy, they are all over, you know, they're, they're all over the waterways. So not only if you need something done in this far off place, as long as you can get a message to Kavana, you can likely get this thing done. Um, and really, again, you have your, your hands free, right? Your resources free mm -hmm. as long as you pay up. So that's how they've enriched themselves over the years. So a not to, um, there's this idea, it's called the, um, 
it's called the obligation in the islands of Kavana. And the obligation is something that says you, as the firstborn of your family, man or woman, are obligated to serve the Kavanian Navy. Um, there's a lot of lore and history wrapped up in that. I'll skip over that. That's also somewhere in the substack. Um, but uh, basically, he just finished his obligation. So he, he's done something that not many people do. Um, they leave. He, he's left after the obligation. Not many people leave after their obligation. Again, reasons, lore, world building. Um, but he left. <laughs> and he went to the one place where he knows literally people who could find him anywhere because of that network aren't going to find him because mm -hmm. it would trigger this big geopolitical event. So that's, again, I mentioned before that Anatu has, to, he's looking for peace. And when he walks into Dunport and uses that weapon in his hand, that's why it's very clear leave. that, oh, there was a Rokita here. Like, mm -hmm. or, oh, there was this guy here with dreads and plugs in his ears. Wait, that sounds like this person I've seen, you know, from Kavana when I was in the kingdom of Edha. Oh, wait, mm -hmm. are you telling me that? They're... So like, you can make big bucks if you show him right here, because you could, like, if you didn't have the Republic Kingdom of Athea's best interest in mind, you could, uh, you, you, you could do a lot with knowing where Natu was because you could gin this up to make it look like any number of things that are being done so that that's again no short answers but that's a little yeah, no that's fine that, I, I want <laughs> these long answers hey real quick do you mind if I take a two second break real quick just no, to use the restroom um and uh so what I'll do is uh I will put some music on and then I will put it on the starting soon screen so that way uh you're not just sitting there <laughs> oh. two seconds <laughs> Drink a little too much coffee this YouTube morning, channel? I feel. Do you want to earn more views? Yeah, I'm more subscribers. That problem. And well, there's uh, the sirens on my end, and of course. Of course. <laughs> uh, yes. Right on time. Give me two seconds and we'll be right back. Yeah, do you think? trying to i guess technically follow the footsteps of every influencer on instagram so i have all these posts scheduled and dreamed up i realized that one of the only ways that i'm going to actually finish this story is if i do that <laughs> and, and get, a, get a little bit more popularity so i had a hey, real ready to post so you know um i think that's like kind of like a perfect segue isn't it remarkable how much time you have to spend on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter to build your brand. And then that takes away time you could be using to build your comic. Absolutely. And it's, I, I could say that it was frustrating and I could spend energy there. But again, if I wanted to, we've, we've been talking for, I don't know, I, I just looked at the clock for the first time, but it seems like hour, somewhere in the minutes. range of, yeah, an hour and a half, right? So, <laughs> um, but half of the stuff we've discussed isn't even in the book yet. Mm -hmm. Or it's stuff that, will never be in the book because it's the type of thing that would just bog down the story mm -hmm. um I, I i need to tell this story though so if needing if the way that i'm going to tell this story is by being on instagram more than i'm comfortable with well guess what i'm going to do because there's yep. no way especially now that i've seen this world you know i've seen a not to in my head a bunch but when i saw you know whether it was uh, Julia, who who first designed the character, and then Dario, who took it to another level and designed the um, the Erosa, the the weapon that he uses, 
um, or Luke, who finally kind of brought him to life over the course of an entire book. Like mm -hmm. this image down, you know, where you were not to is just staring straight ahead and ignoring these guys who are heckling him. Like that man exists for me. He's real. And his story is in my head. And I'm the only person who knows how his story ends. And I can't let that die with me. So I have. To. So that means I'm on Instagram for an hour at a time over the course of, you know, these four moments in the day where I've scheduled my post to be because that's when people are most active. I think guess what I'm going to do? Just that. And that's pretty much like for me, like on Twitter, like, um, you know, I of course have been on Twitter with the Twitch side of things, but like with the keeping it geekly, like I spend hours a day because uh, the, the thing for me is I love comics. I love talking to creators. Um, you know, this is all 100% genuine me being hyped as hell. Like I'm literally hyped as hell. Like I backed this project. I can't wait to read issues one through seven and in, 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 in its entirety. And um, yeah, it's one of those things like in order for me to grow, in order for me to have a bigger audience for you guys to reach a bigger audience, I have to put that fo footwork in too. And it's just the price to pay. You know, you, rent's due every day. One of my good friends uh, tweeted that out uh, a couple of days ago and it's true. Rent is due every day and you have to pay it. Yep. It's and it's it's funny because uh, you know, again, I, I we talked about expectations a bit, and I think in both of our shoes, right, we're trying to build these fan bases and these networks of, of people who are curious about and excited about the work that we do, um, whether it's to sit down and listen to creators chat about their projects or support the project directly. Like, it's so all of it's based on the size of that that initial network. It may be only. Mm -hmm. 5% of that network are engaged, but if that's the case, then I need a lot more than 500, right? Yeah, and so yeah. getting a lot more than 500 means a certain post frequency, a certain type of post, um, then, then I'm just gonna lean into that because again, like this moment right here with Anatu walking into the city, um, uh, that's Ports Keep right there. That is the, um, the, the port that connects uh, it's in the background, so mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily right on the other side of this gate, but it sits at the top of you know this this hill. Um, but that is that, that's built into a wall of battlements that connect um, that face inland, right? So you would expect, um, and one of the things that I play with here is you would expect military fortifications to be on the coastland side, but in Dunport they're actually on the inland side because it was one of the things that. Uh, one of the first things that the members of the NEA did um, kind of nefariously is they built up the fortifications here because they expected battle to come, you know, not necessarily from off land, but or offshore, but onshore from folks who were kind of fighting back on behalf of the empire. So um, it's just one of the, the fun things. So like when I see that, I don't just see him walking in this cool setting with a cool cat. I own mm -hmm. cats, so I'm thrilled. No, I, I know I got cats too, so I seen the cat. I was like, yeah, boy. <laughs> um, you know, uh, <laughs> and you know, cats. Cats are a, a big part. If you ever take, if you ever been to Puerto Rico, an old San Juan, um, there's this strip of land where um, it kind of runs along the water, and there's cats just mm -hmm. everywhere. And, it, and apparently, sounds like yeah, who did? I mean, I, it, it's amazing. These cats are super friendly. They come up to you. They live on the coast. Um, they like bathe in the sun on these rocks near the waves. It's awesome. I mean, it's an old San Juan. I can't remember the name of the fortification, but there's a lot of old like military fortifications in old San Juan. Long story short, I think it was a Dutch ship or something like dropped like thousands of cats off on this strip of land hundreds of years ago. And they've been here ever since. And so like, I don't know, it's just one of those weird world building elements yeah. that seem like it made sense. So there's your cat. No, that, and that, that that is that's crazy to think about too. How this ship just brought a bunch of cats and just dumped it off. Um, I don't know if crazy. you noticed it when you were talking earlier. My one of my cats jumped up, so there was a tail just going back and forth while while I was kneading on my lap. Um, <laughs> it, cat, my my cats were clawing at the door a minute ago. My cat Sansa would certainly be in our face, and so I had mm -hmm. to I had to lock her up. So right here is where we see our protagonist go into the inn. And this is uh, the faithful encounter you were talking about earlier. Um, we start with uh, needing uh, the weapons checked in though, which I thought was really interesting as well, kind of to leave him armless. Yeah. Just another one of those nods that there's a world here that has rules, it has expectations, mm -hmm. and just really quickly without being bogged down too much. In the city of Dunport, this, is, this has always been um, one of the most active ports in this region of the world. When it was connected to the empire before the secession, and the secession was 52 years before the events of this story, um, 
before and after that secession, the city of Dunport was super valuable. So you can't walk around in the city of Dunport with weapons inside the establishments. You can do it, you know, to go to and fro because you're getting off ships and you usually don't live there, you know, but it's a very, very wealthy city. And mm -hmm. there's so what, so what happens here um, is, um, you know, very rare here. Uh, you, you're not supposed to bring weapons in. So he, being the cautious person that he is, he, he checks it out, sees that nobody else is armed, and he eventually willingly checks in his weapons. And then uh, it seems like the bar I keep is uh, assuming that he's here for work, uh, mentioning uh, the early harvest uh, for season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, he, he sees... He sees a Natsu, and when you see a Natsu, he's a physically strapping individual. He spent the last, you know, decade or so of his life fighting in the military. So mm -hmm. like most people, you know, who are in the military, they are physically fit and physically yeah. imposing. And so when he walks in with this big weapon that, you know, is like not really a weapon he's familiar with, up a little bit more, I say that Gerald, who's the barkeep, he mistakes um, this weapon for a thresher. I don't know if you know what a thresher is, but it's um this big farm tool that basically chops down okay. stalks of wheat and so it's like a big scythe almost okay um, and, so that's uh, why he, so he mentioned the farm yeah so he's like yeah it's a thrush like he's not really looking he's doing the dishes mm -hmm. right so he's like who's this guy like give me this weird thing what is a thresher like if you're looking for farming work then yeah you know, yeah yeah the yeah. first time he really gets a look at the weapon is right here in this panel that you just showed up and so now it kind of clicks for him like oh that that's not a thresher <laughs> yeah um you know what i'm saying so and again it, that, that's just a, a subtle way that i am trying to do some world building in these quick and small panels where you know basically like here's this guy who's not really paying attention to what's going mm -hmm. on but he knows all right you can't walk around with that thing in my bar and he's like, oh, <laughs> shit, what, what is what is that in my bar and now he's starting to recognize that this guy is not from around here Mm -hmm. Cautious one, aren't you? Uh, kind of leaning into uh, his cautious nature, looking around to see if there's weapons. Yep. And um, so you see kind of the, the railing there, that the stairs leading up to the rooms are, are right behind a Natu. And so really in this page break, you have a Natu who kind of checks out his room. And, and mm -hmm. by the time he comes back, his, his dinner's there. He's eating the dinner. One of the things that um, in this exchange, it doesn't show up really well in the black and white, but it's clearer in the color. Um, not to ask for water, um, and uh, um, Geralt says, "I'll give you piss warm ale." And yeah. um, so, not to doesn't drink the ale. And that's always something that um, uh, again, not many people. I don't, if they notice, they don't bring it up, and if they don't bring it up, they don't notice that's important. But he doesn't drink the ale on purpose, um, and, and I don't go into why he doesn't, um, but I will eventually okay. um, because there's going to be a there's a, there's a reason why not to doesn't. Drink. Okay, yeah, and well, we can save that for another time. You know, I, I, I know when not to dig in too deep. So this is when yeah, we we'll kind of see we'll uh, a familiar face from earlier up here. And, and you know, the, the idea here is uh, maybe the face isn't familiar because they are two different individuals, but that outfit and that, you can see it right there, that fiery hand sigil is mm -hmm. something that we've seen before. And okay. So, I want to leave the question in the reader's mind, are those two individuals connected and they're obviously connected, but how connected? What is mm -hmm. this exchange? Is this exchange something to do with Geralt and this stranger? Is this exchange something to do with Geralt, the stranger and a Natu? Like what is going on here is one of the early questions that I wanted to leave in reader's minds because um, again, there's, there, there, there's a reason for all of it, but it, yeah, to me, it paints a, a more, um, nuanced fight in this bar yeah yeah and uh this is where we kind of see it start to happen uh the barkeep telling him he knows the rules and of course the other person saying sod you know sod the rules just pour me a cup i want to drink um so what's going on in this what, scene right here exactly the question oh. and that is something that i won't answer right but the question <laughs> is what rules are they talking about are they talking about the rules of checking the weapons um because if this guy's a local and he's asking for a cup but he's still got a weapon on his on his hip which you'll see in the next panel they go into um is that the rules he's talking about are there some other rules is there some other engagement that you know he's coming in here for again it was he tipped off by the guy at the docks that a nazi mm -hmm. came in like well I, i'm purposely leaving that kind of muddy and murky um 
you know, is there is there something, you know, this drunk guy comes over at the bar and I was like, I'll just give him a drink, like whatever. Like, does he know him? Is he vouching for him? Um, you know, and then what what ends up happening on the, the next page when these guards come in, they were actually this guy, it seems like was just buying a drink to try and to 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 kind of phase in here and, and not mm-hmm. be caught by these guards. Um, you know, but you you never know. Like, or were these guards just patrolling and they heard this this tussle at the door about someone not wanting to check weapons? All yeah, of right that here. is very purposely gray, um, because again, it'll eventually be answered. We'll, we'll we'll get back to this this crew in a bit. Then you um, have him trying to give him a drink of his, and he's like, "What the hell are you yeah. doing? You know the rules too." Yeah, and so a lot of the weird words in this page, and I use a lot of them. They're uh, they're just medieval slang. And, mm-hmm. You the know, dew beater. I, yeah, you know. <laughs> what so would the dew beater I, I, mean? Uh, is that like uh it's like someone who's slow. Okay, someone I gotcha. Who's, yeah, yeah. Just someone who's an idiot. Like what do you like yeah? And we wouldn't the the the, the actual one to one is something that we don't really say anymore because we know it's offensive. But it's See, uh, uh, I gotcha, I gotcha, yeah. I gotcha. Yeah, yeah. because uh, I was always like, there's so many sayings like uh so poor you don't have a pot to piss in. That literally meant someone was so poor they didn't have the pot. The yeah. So that's why I was asking because like sometimes that those yeah. old school things have like such insane meanings like um, You were yeah. so poor you didn't uh, the the dirt floor one like uh, that was literally people just sleeping on the dirt floor like It's crazy to think it's, about um, they're, they're, I've got like a running list on my computer somewhere with their one-to-one So yeah a- after that very weird and it's, it's supposed to be weird It's supposed to be like a what is going on like why are they arguing why are these guards like what is like, Who is this dude? And we will get that answer. Um, just, you know, you got to wait a little bit, but you, you will get that answer. So right at the bar, we see these two uh, pop in like, there he is. Hey. And then uh, things are about to get very chaotic. We see, you know, him eventually take the barkeep hostage. Yeah. And so when he, you know, he hops and he, he, he he's hopping directly towards Geralt, grabs him right away, thinking that he's just going to get, he's going to get out of this bar by, you know, Holding Gerald because everybody knows who Gerald is. The bards, the bards in is you know again this is a it's a it's a it's a, it's a well traveled city. So these guards know where they are. They know where the barkeep is. So in his mind, it's like well they're not gonna let me kill him. So I'm gonna get out. He doesn't mm-hmm. know the guy he just bumped into at the bar happens to be who he happens to be. And yeah. So I'm not to, you know almost by reflex, um, you know jumps into action. And so, you know, again, we we address this later on when Anatu and Geralt kind of debrief, but he tells you why he jumped into action, but he does. Um, that little lock that gets cut off in the second panel, um, do you see that? Mm-hmm. Funny story that Luke forgot to erase that, but I thought it was perfect just to show you how <laughs> close Anatu came to having his head chopped off. Mm-hmm. He's got a lock cut off. We have um, uh, uh, Boopy Doopy 3 on t- uh, Twitch, by the way, saying the art looks fire. I have to, I have to really uh, con- say that, yeah, the art is amazing in this. I really love the style. I think uh, your artist really killed it. Yeah, Luke, Luke is phenomenal, and, and Luke and the rest of the team, I think, does a good job of following the tone that Luke set. Because you know, one of the realities of indie comic creation is it takes a long time, um, but there's a lot of story for me to tell so the idea of having luke take the lion's share of the work and then have other people who can match and mirror his tone a bit um Mm -hmm. i think has created a really um vibrant story so yeah the artists are phenomenal and and i take no credit for the art that is all them i tag them and everything i shout them out as often as i can luke horsman has been doing comics for 20 years he's phenomenal I love uh, how everyone's just in shock to be yeah. bewilderment because they, they had no idea who this guy was and he just came yeah. out of nowhere and just like dismantled this guy as so by that, his throat. That, that's the, and, and that that's, again, like I go back to this scene a lot, to be honest with you, and I wonder if it was a mistake because I, there are so, I talked about foreshadowing, there's so many things that I leave wide open here. Like what were Gerald and this guy talking about at the bar? why is this guy you know armed and, and himself pretty handy with this sword why does he look like he's wearing the same thing as the guy from the dock so like i layer in so much into this scene where we introduce an atu where i again i go back like, man did i do too much but i don't think i did not because i'm any more confident 
I actually like two weeks ago was talking to my wife about the regrets I have with this scene. <laughs> but so many people fall in love with the Nazis. So many people find that a Nazi is their favorite character, which although he's the protagonist, he actually is one of the last characters that I wrote into this story. Really? Um, early, yeah, early beta readers who read this story without a Nazi in it said the story felt too disjointed. It wasn't this fiber that made them care about all of these disparate pieces. Um, and so I wrote a not to. Um, I, if I, I, I had, I had people who read volume books one through seven with no a not to. There are people out there who've read that. Friends of mine, family members of mine, and the the feedback was almost unanimous. Like this world is really rich, but it doesn't make sense to me right so now. What happens, I, I don't know where to look. So what happened in issue one without him? How did that issue one look? <laughs> So that issue one, so if you remove a Nazi's pages, right, we don't visit Dumport, um, and that's really the only thing that changes. You see, you flowed from following King Julius, Queen Alaria, and at the time, um, there was a bit more of the magic into that here. There's a scene where I introduced Niawi of the Order of the Dray Crest, and that got pushed back further. So you could replace the introduction of this magical being, which at the time, you can't really tell how magical they are but they're mm -hmm. surrounded by magic um the uh so yeah that that pretty much is what got swapped out um instead of introducing three people who were in three just different spaces all of these mm -hmm. people are still kind of geolocated within a theater and i think that for whatever reason that i didn't get that feedback once i told the nazi story and i think it's because i was talking about the military with julius i was talking about the politics with Alaria and the magic with niawi and it was like well everything's way up here where would i be who would i be mm -hmm. on level with and i think a lot of people felt like that would be a nazi that yeah wow it's it's just, it's so crazy to think of it uh, split up like that. We have a uh, boopy doopy o three uh, on Twitch saying uh, they went on a binge of the podcast after they discovered me, and now they seen we are live. Welcome. If you have any questions about any and in uh, the Rule of Nine, feel free to drop them. We're going through issue one, and I uh, that link to get to his Substack to read issue one for yourself is in the description as well. So now we are at Evermore Castle, and this is kind of where we get a little bit of a breakdown for the Rule of Nine. Yep. And so what Alari is doing here, we could get into the weeds about this conversation, but I'm going to, unless you want to, I'm going to stay clear of that. But yeah, that's um, because we kind of, we, we, we touched on what the rule of nine was, but this was my way of giving hints as to what it was and, and what it was about. And I let you know that it's this political idea. And, and But what Alari is doing, she recognizes that, um, she recognizes that this thing that her grandmother thought up right and, and mm -hmm. spearheaded is really going to come down to what she does and doesn't do so when she has to abdicate power because one of the things she technically could do right she could abdicate power before she dies if she wants and end the first any that's not necessarily written into the rule of nine but it's one of those government loopholes that government people like to find yeah, so yeah. <laughs> she, she, could, she could end it all right now she's the queen who's going to stop her right she could tell everybody take your ball go home First, any of it is done, and you got three months to figure out the next one. Mm -hmm. Or she could just die and let them figure it out after. But either way, she decided <laughs> to start this school where she will teach um, children within, um, you know, uh, noble houses who are families who are interested in sending their children can send them to Ania, and she will teach them um, really political history and, and civics and government and all of these different things. Um, in the event that they are chosen, their families are chosen to become, you know, the next, a part of the next Ennead. And so, mm -hmm. again, it's one of those bits of world building that I never really say explicitly, but that's what she's doing. So these children are all connected to, in one way or another, some major house. Now, maybe mm -hmm. that's a major house who's already a part of the Ennead, because there's no part of the Rule of Nine that says the Ennead can't be from within, right? You can, you know, another the same family can be chosen again right there's no rules against that um so some families who are already in it send you know one of their kids um some families who aren't in it but who are kind of related to wealth and power and, and close enough to it to think they could be a part of it are sending their kids so that's what she's doing right here it's basically a civics course for the um the the, the next generation of potential leaders and then real quick uh we had uh our new friend over on 
Twitch asking, is this out to read? So I'm gonna go ahead and just post uh, the um, yep. the comic Substack right here. You uh, you just go on there and then, uh, is there a particular, I'm gonna actually, I for me, I, I, I think it forced me to sign up for a free account. Um, it might not for you. Uh, if it does, let, let us know though, cause we're still learning that. Here's the actual link to the comic itself for you, Boopy, to check it out. Um, yeah, dude, so it looked like you picked up a new reader along the way. This is awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. But one thing about the this is, so when you when you click any link on Substack, it's gonna pop. It's gonna pop up. If you've never been on Substack on that particular Substack. It's gonna say sign up for the newsletter. But mm -hmm. underneath that, it should say. And again, I could be wrong, but it should say let me read it first. And when if you click let me read it first on a post that is free to read, because some of them are behind a paywall. If you click let me read it first on a post that is free, it should pop up. So you I should gotcha. be able to read this for free. Um, again, if not, yeah, I probably just seen the big I, box and didn't look for the yeah, small and that's, print. And that's what they, that's what they <laughs> want you to do. They want you to see the big box and sign mm -hmm. up, um, you know, get you in the funnel. So again, I, I appreciate Substack for that. Um, but yeah, that, that's, that's what's going on here. And again, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pumped for anybody who wants to read it. Um, you know, again, I, like I said, we can dive into this, but I'm, these characters are important. They're not, mm -hmm. they're definitely not protagonists, but they're kids of families who, your artist, you know, though. have history and. Artists did a good job too, because there's uh, exactly nine people. So you know what I mean. I thought yeah. I, I was I was yeah. looking for that too. Yeah, and you know little things, you know little things like that uh, I put in just because for me, you know, there's if you're watching a movie, there's always things like that where they put in just little nods, and mm -hmm. you know there might be more than nine kids there, but I wanted it to be introduced with that. So Luke did a great job of of honoring that. Um, you know, so again, all these kids matter, and they they embody the ideals of their families in a way um and so i wanted them to have their own voice i wanted them to have their own opinion so this little argument about and this argument of, and you gotta remember i was writing this in 2020 so this argument about what is a just full and an unjust use of force mm -hmm. um had everything to do with the way that things were unfolding when it came to uh, police brutality in the year of 2020. So on the heels of George Floyd and, and all these, uh, I don't know if uh, Philando Castile was 2020, I can't remember, but all of these different events, like I, in my, it was very pressing for me to talk about uh, um, use of force mm -hmm. and what was a just, what was a justifiable use of force. And, and so I don't, I don't like to do those things um, on the nose uh, when I write because I think that that can be a little a little heavy-handed but I wanted to talk about that so and there's also a, I'd be lying if I said I didn't sneak a tad bit of foreshadowing into this exchange because um, I did um, <laughs> but that so so this idea of what is too much um, and it, it, I think the first question is you know what if you're what if what if innocents are harmed along the way you know what do you think about that and some people say, well, that dishonors the rule of nine. And other people think, well, no, like you got to do what you have to do to uphold the rule of nine. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that is uh, that, a lot of a lot of plates in the air for this one. Too. So what's what's your take in in, in that uh, innocence hurt along the way or that's just what it takes for the rule of nine? What would you say would be your take if you were in that argument? If I was in that argument, I think I would, uh, the gentleman who's on the far right there that you see in that top panel that's visible, that's Rohan. Um, and, and his take is that, you know, look, whatever ends up happening is collateral damage. And I think if I go back to my days in philosophy class, I probably would have been him. Um, the person who was just saying, look, I recognize that we want the world to be a better place and we want the world to be uh, a peaceful place. But if we believe we're best suited to do that, then when we decide and he's speaking as though he's already got power, he's speaking mm -hmm. as though he's already in these shoes and he's not he's a little kid in a courtyard right but like if you think about me at that time i totally would have been that kid who's like look guys like look i don't like that the u.s is you know in so many different places across the, the world you know and um, from a military perspective but if it equals peace at home then maybe it's worth it right like i certainly would have kicked the can in that discount on that you know i would have kicked that can in my political philosophy class mm -hmm. one thousand percent i might not necessarily agree with that as an individual you know uh, like a personal viewpoint but i think one of the big things that i get when i look back in in, in history um because I'm, I'm someone who's fond of studying history i, I find it enjoyable 
you know, one of the things that we struggle with that we can't really do fairly is take today's ideals and judge decisions of the past. I mean, we can do that, but it's not going to give us any better understanding of why people made the decisions they made in the past. And so um, it's, it's a weird line to try to straddle and say that while I totally disagree with and I brought up the founding fathers, so I'll go here again. This is what I wasn't necessarily going to touch then. I totally disagree with their viewpoints on slavery and justifying the continuation of slavery when they, um, you know, wrote the the Constitution and Bill of Rights and all these things. Like I, I, I think that this idea that slavery was shoehorned into that and continued um, while they were on the one hand fighting for these greater ideals, I think that that is from today's perspective absolute bullshit. But if you look at why they did it, they were trying to make sure that a nascent country didn't break in half because you never would have, we never would have found sovereignty if the South had backed out before we started. Because that's so exactly, had to shoot, that's yeah, what happened to shoot a couple, slavery in. couple yeah, hundred exactly. years later, right? Uh, they, so, they tried to do that and then we broke apart. And, and one of the things that the founding fathers get criticized for a lot is this idea, well, they, they made the claim that they saw that you know this would ultimately be the end because if you read some of their journals which are available there's this great book called founding brothers i'm going to blank on the artist i mean excuse me on the author's name but it's a great book that gives you a deeper insight into the founding fathers and the decisions they were making but and it, it's tough to grapple with this right especially to publicly grapple with this as a black man i get in trouble for this sometimes because um if you're not listening it sounds like i'm justifying the continuation of slavery i'm not but i am saying that Again, we wouldn't be where we are today had had anybody in that room who really felt strong enough to say we should end slavery now, they would have never agreed on anything and the nation wouldn't have, mm -hmm. it wouldn't, it wouldn't have been formed. You had and to so, do uh, evil for the greater good. You, and, and, and that is something that no matter how nasty it is to say, it's still, it was true then and it's still true. And it's still true when you're talking from a geopolitical scale. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's nasty, and I don't feel good about saying it. But you know, I, I'm I'm not happy that we send people to war. I, I'm not someone who is, you know, um, going to the polls and voting for the warmonger. Like I don't do those things. But if I take a step back and I honestly look at the span of time that humans have been, you know, recording history on this globe, it's it's what we do time and time again. And so, in writing this story. Um, I wanted to make it clear off the bat that I wasn't necessarily going to shy away from that truth. It's yeah. ugly and we don't like it, but it is still a truth that people in power will oftentimes make a decision, um, you know, uh, that, that we wouldn't make as individuals, but that needs to be made on that mm -hmm. level. And so that's what this conversation is, because, again, she's grooming these children to be prepared now, she's not showing you what her opinion is either. She's just asking questions, right? Mm -hmm. Because you don't know if she agrees or disagrees with Rohan. Like, you don't know what she thinks. She just knows that they have to know what they think because if they're in these shoes at one point in time, they're going to have to make decisions. So she wants to get them ready to make those tough decisions that leaders often have to make. And what a... What a... Like, you have such, like, an immeasurable, like, deep understanding, like, just beneath the surface of like how this stuff works it's like it's it was it was so captivating to just listen to you break that down and 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 stuff and i i could totally get like where you know you as a black man like trying to like say you understand why the founding fathers did that on the surface people might look at that and be like what the you know what do you mean but like once you dig <laughs> deeper dude. yeah once you deep, dig deeper it's like no you're you're right on the nose you're right on the money with it and and it's and it's troubling right because i I'm, i have no problem saying I, i'm a i'm a progressive i've always voted for the most progressive candidate possible on whatever ballot i'm looking at but again i don't live in a fantasy world either so i recognize that while i will always and i always have i i march i'm an activist i've been an activist in the past to say that i am now is actually not true so let me walk that back but i've been an activist in the past and very outspoken on mm -hmm. very political issues that were important locally um you know, but but, I, but again, I've also still, you still got to go to the polls and make a decision, right? So if there's no person who exactly lines up with my political outlook, I do think it's politically irresponsible for me to stay home. I think I have to do my homework and I have to figure out, well, who's the person who's going to either walk the line as it is now so we can keep fighting our fight? Who's the person who's going to move us a step forward? Or 
sometimes who's the person who's only going to knock us back one step instead of five steps yeah right? yeah so when, we, when we when we stay home and the person who's going to knock us back five steps ends up winning and now we're fucked and so that's something that is inherent too and again like i said i don't do it on the nose we can literally make this a whole podcast i feel, I feel like me and you are on like such like similar levels because like dude you dive into deeper what if that politician is just being fake you know what, what if that politician is just a snake and just like led you to the water hole um yeah. there's so much that goes into this and man at the end of the day it just sucks because it's, it's like um, you get put in that mindset, like, does my vote matter? Um, like, because of the electoral college, that's such a big hox of bullshit, right? And there's a, uh, and there's so many so many questions, right? Like, uh, in my and the electoral college, that's one that's been a hot button topic, hot button topic for us lately here in the states. And you know, again, like, does the electoral college serve us right now? No, it doesn't. Because, and again, the us I'm speaking of when I say that is people who have. Um, progressive leaning values in the United mm -hmm. States of America. The electoral college doesn't serve us, but all we have to do is look at what's going on. And this can veer off very quickly into political conversation. All we have to do right now is look at what's going on in the Supreme court at the mm -hmm. Supreme court level. Politics have over the decades seeped their way into this place that was supposed to be apolitical. And the Supreme court is certainly a political tool right now. And it is packed with folks who have conservative leaning values. And, and in the same way now that the Supreme Court is being mismanaged because it's doing something it's not supposed to do, it's not supposed to be a political tool, but it is, you could see the, the overall kind of electoral map shifting in a way where now all mm -hmm. of a sudden the electoral college is beneficial to people who have the views we believe. The, the, it currently you know, it is, is what allows um, the, the conservative folks in the ring to, to, to kind of stand a chance of winning right now but there's no reason why that couldn't change so this idea that we should just get rid of the electoral college because right now it's not to our advantage is up in the air think about what happened with the filibuster the filibuster was put in and again we could go this could go bad really yeah quick. yeah but the, <laughs> the filibuster was put in by the the american left and and it was a really good idea when they did it about 10 12 years ago and made it 60 votes and now they can't get a bill passed so I don't know like when you make these and again all of these big questions it doesn't mean that i'm unsure of where i stand as an individual on each one of these issues but when i write any of the rule of nine i try not to write it like that i try to write it in a way that takes a look at the way mm -hmm. that politics actually have functioned in the past and function today and that typically is between factions who have very strong disagreements with one another sometimes as you said feigning support because they're trying to be a snake oil salesman or people who just vehemently hate one another because they have different beliefs and and all of that's going to play out here in this book as long as i can tell the story long enough so like i want you to realize halfway through volume two when we get there like i thought i knew this character Fuck, i was wrong because then it makes you <laughs> second guess what how you think about politics and how you layer in your own assumptions into the way and people behave right because that to me is a much richer story mm -hmm. so I, again, I, 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 I've already said way more about politics than I've ever said. No, Canada. we're fine. We're fine. Uh, we have but, uh, Boopy uh, Doopy over on Twitch <laughs> again, came here to listen to a chill podcast while they draw, getting my mind blown <laughs> instead. So this is actually, uh, Boopy is the artist. I did an interview with Pam Cake of Art of War. It's a manga. Did that yesterday. So uh -huh. Boopy is the artist that came to listen to Pam's uh, podcast, but then is, has been drawing to, uh, to our, our chat and yeah, this is. Well, I, I feel like we could literally break down so much. Um, it's my and my my last part uh, before we uh, get back on onto uh, the course of action. I love how many people are like Democrats and Republicans, and they hate each other without realizing. Like thirty years ago, it, they were just they they switched. So uh, yeah. you know, a Republican today, like forty years ago, would have been a Democrat. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I love that too. <laughs> yeah, that's and 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 again, I'm an I'm a registered independent, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, so. Uh, I, I do in the way that the modern American political landscape do Democrats more often than not line up with me and my values. Yeah, that's the way it works right now. But you just hit the nail on the head. You know, the last real major political movement in the U.S. took place when, you know, it was the Democrats who were making some of the decisions that we now 
would map onto the conservatives. Like one of the craziest things you do, you take political values and you put them on a map. And then you move those political values from 1900 to 2022 and watch how they've changed parties. Watch how they've gone from red to blue and then back to blue or the other mm-hmm. vice versa, right? And so, again, I am not unaware of how I feel and, and, and what I, where I stand on certain topics and certain policy decisions. I'm very clear about where JL fits mm-hmm. and where JL would like to see the people responsible for his neighborhood and his state, and his country go but i'm not stupid enough to think that just because it doesn't flow that way that everything needs to you know you know always be i don't believe that are there certain things that i am very very strongly against absolutely Mm -hmm. um but the world still has to turn and the world is still going to turn so what am i going to do about it and that's again one of the things that I play with a lot in any like there's these characters that I introduce you to and you fall in love with them. But what what happens if Anatu turns out to be a, an asshole when everybody who's loved him for these first seven issues realizes, oh shit, I've been rooting for the bad guy. Or what I was gonna do with Julius in the beginning. What if I actually am still doing that? What if he is the series antagonist? What if he does or fuck, what if it's Alaria? What if Alaria is some does, snake oil? Like, I, I... Like, I, I don't, I'm trying to do I'm trying to do it with all my characters so oh, you don't I love know it. which or if it's happening with any of them. But it could. But I'm positioning them all as at least gray. Mm-hmm. But they could go they they could be your white hat your black hat by the end of it. That is not on purpose for this black with this black hat on the screen, I swear. <laughs> So what are we seeing right here? We kind of see them in the middle. uh, They're on a field. Um, They've made it back to camp. Um, mm -hmm. They have, after Ulysses' slaughter of those individuals, they made it back to camp. um, And and they're now being told, hey, you know, we caught somebody on the road and he wants to talk to you. Like, but the person they caught him, because this camp was set up outside of Feetin. Feetin is a small um, um, town, pretty Mm -hmm. much, that sits in the shadow of the Fremont mountain range and the Fremont mountain range cuts. Um, it's a natural border between the Republic kingdom and excuse me, a land, a swath of land known as the ungoverned land. Mm-hmm. The ungoverned lands are ungoverned for a reason. We won't go there because I haven't gone there on the page yet. Um, but they're ungoverned for a reason. But on the other side of the ungoverned lands are the, uh, the edges of the Debashi empire. So there's only one way out of you. So, the people who were, were leaving Thetan, you know, they were either a part of what just went down and the people who got killed or they were members of the town of Thetan. So mm-hmm. the king's like, wait, he, someone's here saying that there were brigands in Thetan? There weren't brigands in Thetan. Yeah, no way. Like, what, what are you talking about? I was just there. Like, there were certainly some, there were some things that went down in Thetan, but what do you mean? And so his ears are perked up. And now mm-hmm. his sons who are trying to... Um, you know, Udonis is just saying the obvious. It's probably the guy that got away. And now Micah, who is trying to uh, impress his father, is trying to say too much. And his father kind of just clowns him. And it's no shit, Sherlock. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we have uh, Boopy say it uh, gives him uh, AOT vibes. I got to admit, when you were kind of describing, like, how uh, the fortifications, like, how the port wasn't heavily uh, fortified and like more uh, towards the center was, it kind of did give me Attack on Titan vibes as well, like which is kind of how they they had their, uh, you know, the heart of it mm-hmm. was the most of, uh, fortified. And and so, you know, uh, I, don't, I there are no <laughs> Titans in my, <laughs> there's none of that, but, but I do, yes, but in the sense that, and, and I, I'm not really well versed on Attack on Titan, but I have, I'm familiar enough, like I've, I've watched a lot of commentary on it, read a lot about it, but I haven't mm-hmm. watched the show yet. Um, but uh, in the sense that, like, there's there, I know there's this big kind of 180 on what you think you're looking at. Um, uh, I, I'm doing a lot of that. I'm, you, you think you're looking at a story from a very particular perspective, um, and, and don't be surprised if it gets flipped on you. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, in that regard, the little I do know of the show, there's definitely some of that in here. Um, and, and then the darkness and the kind of the grittiness, right? That's a very gritty story. Oh, yeah. That's a very in your face like oh the world's not friendly huh that's kind of what i'm getting at (laughs) the world's not a very friendly place i think you do uh the the feeling of despair pretty well too within this world like how it has that that uneasing feeling um i really enjoy that as well so I like this too, how he, he says, I have, have him fed, see his horse and tell him nothing of who we are. Kind of give him like slip him the woo. Yeah. Get, get yeah. him comfortable. Let him think that we believe his story and then bring him to me. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so what you have, uh, you have in the next page, after this page break, all that stuff has happened. And now this man whose name is uh, Rippin Andari, who he, he tells you that in, the, in a bit, um, comes in to try to basically pull the wool over the king's eyes and the king's not really having much of it. So they go back and forth here. Um, the gray balloons here are Micah's uh, thoughts because um, Micah is, um, he's someone who will eventually kind of be his own POV type character. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to share his thoughts here. And he's he's he, he's just been, um, you know, embarrassed by his father. And so in his mind, he's like seething. And yeah, he's so, he's so worked that, up from it. Yeah, so I just, I, I felt that that was important because eventually that will become super important. And this is, again, one of those things that I put in here that I have second thoughts about. But mm-hmm. I think it still works and, and I'm okay with the fact that I went with it. But if I was doing it today, I wouldn't include um, or I would include another way. Um, there's a scene. I, I tell short stories in the moments just before and after this on the Substack because Micah is someone that I focus a lot on in the short stories because his character is very important to uh, the way that this this unconventional monarchical system works. Because if this were a normal kingdom he'd be the next in line for the throne. He's the oldest mm-hmm. child of U- Udon, is, or excuse me, Julius and Alaria, but he's not getting anything um, unless the people vote for him. So part of why Udon is, or excuse me, Julius is so caught up in the legacy talk with his kids is, you know, in a second here, in a couple of years here, you guys might not have anything. Like yeah. you, so you have to be able to act and, and you better hope that people look to you and fear or respect you because if they don't you know you know what happens mm-hmm. to you know heirs of, of former former leaders it's usually not good in these worlds so like he's just got some emotional damage and baggage that um, i definitely lean into um and, but i wanted to i wanted it, the early flavor of that to be here so him being kind of irrationally angry right now um, it's the way that I chose to do that. But again, I, I probably would have changed that if you, if you let me redo it. So we are kind of seeing where uh, this uh, mysterious man is uh, trying to sell a, a story to the king that is uh, turning not to be uh, true. You know, thieves, uh, pillagers, thugs all have the same look of desperation, kind of getting called out. Yeah, because he's trying to say like, you know, Hey, you know, I, I'm because the king recognizes him, right? That, that guy on the horse in the, in the page three looks back at the king. The king recognized, like, that was you, idiot. Like, I saw you. Like, you might not think I saw you because you think I was paying attention over here, but the king is a, he knows his way around the battlefield. He saw mm-hmm. that man and he knows who he is. So, you know, he's, he's, when this guy is trying to say that he's from Thetan, he's like, dude, I'm not from, like, I know you're not from Thetan. And, like, I also know that thieves and brigands and all these people, they, they look desperate. They look run down. You and the men that were in Thetan, you guys were cleaned up nice. You're all wearing the same clothes. And then on top of this, you've now changed your clothes. Mm-hmm. So you obviously, like, and that's why he's like, dude, I'm not a thief. He's like, no, I know you're not a thief. I'm telling you who you are. I'm telling you that I know who you are. So it's in this moment that the king starts to turn and say like, dude, stop playing with me. I know who you yeah. are. But Andari doesn't bite. He keeps trying to convince the king that, um, you know, he is this member of Theon. And in this moment right here, kind of shows his hand. Lord Andian is the Lord of Freemount. He's a member of the Nine. We meet him in an issue in issue two. Um, and this individual thinks that because this person who rode up on the town got there relatively quickly, he's thinking, all right, this must be the Lord. Like. You know, the Lord's probably one of these lords that never comes here. Look at this shitty town. Like, mm-hmm. you know, because they had a, the, this group of people had a mission, right? We don't know what their mission is. You might not know what it is, you know, but you can read between the lines. Um, so he's he thinks he's talking to this lord who's this, you know, really just dispassionate ruler. And what he realizes is like, no, like you actually have this all wrong. Lord Andean is actually a very, very devout leader because he's a very religious man, so he takes mm-hmm. his role very seriously. And on top of that, I'm not him, stupid. I'm the king. And so the king was on, you know, was 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 doing, uh, he's trying to pull the rug out from underneath Andari here in as clever of a way as he can, trying to let Andari talk himself 
into more and more trouble mm-hmm. and, and see what he'll get out of it. And so when he pulls the rug here, um, you know, this is where he and Dari now flips and starts trying to share everything. Like, well, all right, well, now if you know who I am, then let me at least, you know, get out of here, you know, unscathed. And we realize that that's not going to happen in this last panel. Yeah, right here. We have all we need from the man. See that he's bound and kept under close watch. And uh, yeah, uh, the the gig's up. They know where uh, the rest of the men are hiding. And this is kind of where we get another pivot back to our other protagonist. Yeah. And so not to here again, just I'm big on making sure that you at least second guess what you what you know about my character. Mm-hmm. So not to um, he's writing. But here's a guy who was just throwing down at the bar. But like what he journals like. <laughs> like so 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 the the, the big baddie he, he's he, he journals too he's, he's mm-hmm. introspective so i'm just trying to share a little bit about again the inner workings of these characters just with these small moments where you can and then Geralt, after seeing how he moves and how he acts remember Geralt thought this guy was walking around with this farmer's tool because yeah. the way that you know this this weapon that are not to use is this modeled after a medieval weapon uh, a weapon with medieval origins called a man catcher. Are you familiar with it? Uh, I think so. I think so. Right? And so it's like vaguely familiar enough of a weapon that like you might have heard of it. You mm-hmm. might know what it is. But most people, when they first see it, they're not going to know what it is. And so that's why Geralt went to, oh, this must be a thresher, right? Like, I don't know. It's the closest thing that I've seen to it. Mm-hmm. But then you realize if you scroll down, he kind of points out and says like, well, what is this? that? How you learned how to use that thing? And then he explains what you use that thing for. And although it's a, a, fant- a fantasy up version of a man catcher, a man catcher was used primarily to take armored men off of horses. So you could pull an armored man off of a horse with this thing. You get it around their neck and you yank them down. Now that they're on their back, now you can get to all their weak points or you can mm-hmm. hold them hostage. Cause now you've got this like six foot pole but their necks are locked into place. And typically there are spikes on the edges uh, on the inside of the man catcher. So if you're fighting to get out, once it's locked around your neck, now oh, you're going to be damaged. So yeah. you, you, you immediately become this docile prisoner, right? And so, and again, Anatu's weapon is just a fancier version of that. But I chose this because that now dictates so much of how Anatu behaves, right? He's got, on the one end, he's got the ability to catch you and this man catcher. And on the other end, there's like the steel pommel. Mm-hmm. So it acts like a mace almost. And so he's got to be very crafty. He's not going to be like this tank of a fighter. So it, I chose that weapon for that reason. And here Make he's more just agile. explaining. Exactly. And, and, and to give him a very particular... Um, uh, feel as a character and so mm-hmm. he's explaining what they used to do and and you can you know take from that what you will and then Geralt is like look you got a night for free but ultimately I got to run a business so after that you know I'll, mm-hmm. I'll expect you to pay up and it's really important that we check his facial expression here because there's something um, to this exchange that makes Geralt uneasy and that is something that again it's just one of those little breadcrumbs that until you get to the next issue you might overlook but it's one of those ways that i try to write in some of the foreshadowing so mm-hmm. you know he's giving him a bit, a bit of advice um but maybe he's not super happy about giving him this advice and that's the feeling that i want you to leave with when you when you exit this page and then down at the bottom you see a mix of uh, commons and nazola which is the language that the Kavanians speak so what this says is i fear i missed the hunt more than i should because a not to again he broke away from that obligation mm-hmm. um and again you wouldn't know that because you don't know what i feel you know i thought um, this was a love letter i thought this was him writing a love letter to a loved one or maybe great. a family member so i'm great. happy you broke that down for me yeah. and and that's the, again like i like that vagueness to the story because you know it could have been right you don't know it's weird language there's enough of it that you can read it um, but you don't really know what he misses. But what he's saying is, I fear I missed the hunt more than I should. Mm-hmm. And what you, you know, so this is something that obviously this is the end of what he was writing. Um, well, we don't know what my next short story that I release on Substack will actually be in that page break, what Anatu does next. And we will get a little bit more insight into uh, where his mind goes after he okay. starts thinking about the life he walked away from. All right, yeah, so we're gonna sell a little bit of some exclusive drops, it seems. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. so now there's, we there's always down. there's a lot going on, yeah. So, here we have the next day, day breaks. Julius is listening, he's leading his men, he's dragging Andari behind. 
uh, because Andari has, you know, told them where they were. That little branch is the dead tree. You've got the, mm -hmm. the fungus growing on the dead tree. Let's you know, like, okay, here we are. They're in the right spot. Shit's about to go down. And uh, the sons are like, you know, hey, did you expect this to be what it is? Like, and they're like, not really. Like, I, mean, I didn't know because they're they're in their late teens, early twenties. Mm -hmm. They don't. They're, they're this is new to them, right? Still they, up behind the ears. Been around exactly for now. <laughs> Um, and so, but you know, there's a short story that explains why Micah stays behind here. The, the king and Micah have a conversation after the events of the last scene that's also on the Substack. Because again, there was so much that I know why these decisions are being made in the page break. Um, but uh, the I don't get the opportunity to always share that. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's that's what you're getting here. I really like how they uh, spread them out five men abreast as well. You stay here with the bulk of the men, guard the rear, make sure no one takes us unaware. And then, uh, yeah, things start getting a lot more insane. <laughs> but this is where we really see the king kind of with his experiences uh, leading the pack and, and, and knowing what to look for as well. You kind of really see that detailed within the panels. Yeah, and that was that's what this is all about. Because, again, Julius is a soldier. He's now a king, but he's really a soldier. And, and, and one of the things that I, we talked about, you know, my feelings on, on war. Um, and, uh, you know, I, again, I'm, I'm not someone who is a, a fan of the idea of war, but it is a reality. And the people who make the decision to go to war, whether you agree with their, polit their politics when they come home, in that role of soldier and warrior, they should be respected. And yeah. again, that, that mistakes are made by everybody everywhere, but people who decide for their life on the line for things that they value and believe in. Um, and, and my sentiments about the police field are, are here as well. It's like there's a certain level of respect you should show until show, someone shows you they don't deserve it. So one of the things that I try to do here with Julius, who is a skilled soldier, um, you see that here. And then as his character develops, he makes certain decisions in the beginning and middle of arc two, where you're like, oh, he's, he is still a soldier. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, we're out here seeing him, but he's making decisions here. And again, uh, very tough decisions, but in the end, and we might not like what he did, but he's doing it to protect the men who are in the position that he was in. And he's making one of those tough calls. And it's like, look, I know what it's like to be where they are right now mm -hmm. so i'm going to do this and and so i'm trying to lay that groundwork here because as you if you scroll down like he knows this setup he knows what's going on he if you scroll that's a that's a fire in the beginning of that panel that's a fire that's recently been doused that blade that's touching the ground that's usually a signaling to his men like they're close so his mm -hmm. men actually in the, in the in the description of the panel here they're forming up even tighter to prepare to make their stand which he explicitly says to his son, because you can't see that on the panel, it was too much. But that's what that exchange is. He sees the fire, he knows they're being mm -hmm. surrounded, they've got the body of water, they're gonna make their stand. So he's acting on instinct here. And so you get to the next page, and now what, what if this were a TV show, would have been a you know three, four minute battle, um, breaks down across a couple of panels and pages where that ambush and that trap that was laid is now set and they, they kind of spring into action so and what, this right here do not waver that's the one luxury you and your brother do not have that that's what i was exactly. talking about earlier how i love that that's, that little line there that's the lesson again and you know it's it's what i'm hinting at up front but i'm explicit with here it's like you've gotta and and again take note that this is one brother and it's the younger brother and and so there's a reason why it's not both um and and so uh, and I get into that, but ultimately what you have here, um, is a, a nice bloody battle. Um, and it's really quick. I wanted to pay, I wanted to spend as much time, if not more time with little small scale battles mm -hmm. and fights and skirmishes, because so much of what we see in big budget fantasy is the big war. But like those things were so infrequent, they required so much from a kingdom or a nation, like to get all of your, you know, all your banners raised to one spot took months. It took half a year to get the yeah. army to the place where you wanted them to fight. And then it was too cold to fight. So you had to winter in that spot. And then the next year is when you fought, right? Yeah. And so and then you have all that food camp. and everything. Yeah. I, the, medieval warfare was a logistical battle. It was, was very rarely a, 
a battle of wills, right? Like it was what about way the revolutionary more one? Like where you have to stand in lines yeah. and you're reloading and you're looking yeah. right there, you're like right and you're like, yeah. like <laughs> So it's that that's that's certainly something I, I play with gunpowder a little bit and the, the upcoming issues and, and what gunpowder would be like in this world and and so yeah there's a lot going on here but that's mm -hmm. why this is so gritty it's so raw but it's so quick because here you have a group of men who are although they're well provisioned they're not anywhere near as well provisioned as armored men who are being led by this really really stout military commander i love how um, uh your artist doesn't stray away from being graphic either we see this dude's yeah. head just get straight up scalp <laughs> it's one of my favorite favorite things um and then so what you have here is you you have udonis who was previously asking his father what it was like to kill a man and now he's set up where like so often was the case in these little small scale skirmishes and even large scale battles they really break down to individual clashes right they're not that line of people loading the muskets. Mm -hmm. They're like one-on-one -on -one and you got to get out and get to the next before somebody comes and, you know, lops your head off. So now Udonis is in one of those situations and he's got to do his thing. And what you see here is he also is fairly crafty with a sword, which you would expect, right? If your dad is who your dad is, in this case, your dad knows his way around a sword. Um, and you would at least hope that you are well trained mm -hmm. enough to defend for your own and so that's what you get and then one of my favorite scenes here that comes off so much better in color if you go down to the bottom of the next page is Udonis you know saying to himself like because you when he asked his father you can go to the next one he says to his father like, what's it like killing your first man and he says oh no it was that one up there sorry if you stop here um, he remembers his father saying, I don't remember what it was like to kill my first man, but I imagine it was bloody. And so Udonis has now just killed his first man and it is very bloody. And mm -hmm. so you can see the the edges of his reflection in the bloody water. And okay, his yeah. mind is like, oh shit, I just I just did it. Like this is what it I, I this is me. Like I'm my mm -hmm. I've I've wet my sword, which is something that I play with in the next couple nice. of weeks. I love how they have uh, dismembered limbs hanging from the trees and stuff. Yeah, so one of the things that I did also is I did a lot of research into medieval torture. I know it's weird, but um, there's a podcast by the name of Dan Carlin who um, he's phenomenal. He does these long form history podcasts and he has one called Painful Tainment. And he talks about the way that our relationship with pain and torture over the years has changed. Again, like one of those things we like to view ourselves as, you know, better than. Um, if you ever want to do that, look at how our very recent ancestors, you know, they're talking 200 years ago, um, were still paying to go to public executions. Um, and so we yeah, hear the it phrase- It's like a, a sport for the family. Yeah, yeah. You get the kids and, and the old lady go yeah. see someone get beheaded. That was like a thing. Exactly. Well, and one, so I lived, one of the tortures that we hear about a lot is being drawn and quartered. But I didn't know what drawn and quartered actually was. I thought that was the thing when they kind of pull you apart in four directions. Yeah, stretch, that's, actually, yeah. that's that's being put on the wheel or, or you know, uh, broken by the wheel. Being drawn and quartered is actually literally having all of your limbs chopped off and then afterwards having your head chopped off. Oh my so God. You're, you're, <laughs> you're quartered, right? You're cutting the fours here with your limbs. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happens to Andari. And if you scroll down, like they're bringing out these, these dead bodies and Michael, who's trying to like, you know, buddy up to his father again, like, oh, no, for ransom, haha. Julius basically says these men are important. Mm -hmm. Udonis being hit with the reality of, oh, shit, I just killed a man and now here's a fucking head. Like, oh my God, this is crazy. He just barbs. barbs. This is his first military campaign. He's like, what the fuck? And, and now you, know, you see the I love this part so much. Finally, with that sword of yours, him. maybe you'll wet yeah. the little one. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, just some life to a fantasy world. Like, right? those are the things that. You know, I always love when I'm reading a fantasy book, you know, like, and that's what these guys, these guys are veterans. Like they've been around, mm -hmm. like you really are, right, you, you killed the man. So what, get over yourself, kid. Like stop throwing up, but you see what they're doing. They're hanging these bodies. Yeah. And so Micah, again, trying to overcompensate, steps in and that's in the next panel, protects his younger brother, but his younger brother just murdered a man. He might mm -hmm. not need your protection, but he's doing what an older brother would do. Father comes in and says enough, Stop talking about home. We're not going home. We're going to Fremont because mm -hmm. this is not what I expected to see. He knows something now, so he's going. He's going to check Mount. it out. And then we get the title drop right here too. Boom. Yep. 
I love um, it. I love it. And then the feet. I love the detail in so, this panel. Yeah, and you talk about counting for nine. So if you count, there are um, nine things hanging in the trees. You've got Andari's four limbs, and you've got five men who aren't all dead, by the way. Um, but but what they they represent nine. And now you have Andari's head turned, looking at the nine. And the mm -hmm. idea is, if anybody is out here hiding in the woods that we didn't kill recognize what happens if you don't observe the rule of nine and that was kind of the like that's I don't know cool and it, it's so under like you don't it, that's like so meta that no one's gonna get that but me. i would have never um, guessed uh but, but that's that, what i love about this that's what's super that was super important and so now you have udonis the younger son grappling with that image now for him he's just a young man grappling with the fact that above him men are hanging there's a head on a log and he just killed the dude in the woods but meta udonis is literally questioning what it means what his father's depiction of respecting the rule of nine means he's taking mm -hmm. all that in right so like it has this existence on the page and then deeper of like well yeah how do we feel about that if this is what it means to observe the rule of nine how do we feel about that how does udonis feel about that and so i, I had a little bit of fun with that That's we have a boopy on over on twitch saying this st stylization is so sick um, that's that and i don't know if you were here before but that was what i was saying with luke he has this ability for these lines to feel so loose it's almost like he was just like like you know i think about like an nba player when they're in the zone and sometimes just doing like disrespectful shit like why are you doing that with the ball why are you gotta dunk it like that like just in their bag of tricks like i feel like that's what luke he you can tell when he's in that space like if you watched him make this page he was probably like so like i see him as like so nonchalant about it but it's still this good mm -hmm. um yeah so it's, it's phenomenal i love the grimace on his face too like yeah. oh yeah those are still alive those guys are very much alive the other three are already dead and probably were dead but i i wonder i remember putting in the description like make sure some of these dudes are still alive so again just to show like all right well you're not dead but you will mm -hmm. be um, and now we have a not to and he's leaving the end and and i chose yeah, someone passed out right here yeah yeah good maybe that's the guy from the beginning who knows but he's just drunk um you know you've got the barkeep here who kind of cuts eyes at him we don't know why um you know we don't know what's going on there i think people will assume that she like them we, we, we don't know but I, I there's a reason why and again i'm just uh trying to add some flavor so that when mm -hmm. you read what goes on later you look back like oh shit like this was she, yeah, she she got a list she wish she won a sword it looks yeah, like you, you never know that could be the case we have a uh, booby saying uh they were about to say uh everything looks so fluid yet gritty at the same time fits the tone for sure i appreciate that and then that's uh, one of the reasons why i went with luke because he it's i've never seen like i've seen i've seen this but i haven't seen this like mm -hmm. it's so it's so him um and this panel is another one so you see that sigil in the center there that is actually the sigil of dumport if you look at the flag right there in the middle of that panel, kind of where you're hovering over, mm -hmm. um, uh, shout out to Dominic Strange who created the maps. I, I created the maps in this online program and then she made them pretty. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's what we got. Uh, and I, I made sure that that got put on the page. Because, so was that also on their shoulder, uh, the the armor? So it, it there's a etchings of it. I told Luke to try and get it in wherever he could. Um, and it's tougher in the smaller spot. So yeah. if there was something that looked like the shape of it, absolutely. Okay. Um, but if you went back, it probably wouldn't be super, super clean. Well, actually, um, so right up here, um, this is kind of what inspired me to ask that. I want to say, yeah, right here, there, you seen the kind of like the that is zone. So that's, yeah, that that's, so if you mean their armor here, that is the, that's an actual, um, I think it's an Enneagram, which is just mm. a nine pointed star type of a deal. And that's the sigil of Aenea. So each okay. one of the houses in the Republic Kingdom has their own sigil. And so the, ho the, the house that rules Dumport has that as their I sigil. I gotcha. Um, and so I wanted these pages to be silent because I wanted them to just stand as world building. Here's this man walking through this very vibrant town square. Um, and he's he's on a mission. Like he's he's gone. He's leaving. He's, he can't be here. But he like he, he, he needs food. So take mm -hmm. the easy provisions while you can. I like bread. So I have to get some bread in there. Um, here we get a close up on um, the Port's Keep, and you can kind of see here in these panels 
that this port is kind of connected to a bigger set of battlements. Like I said, there's this earthen mm -hmm. moat that's not full, um, but it's like this 30 foot moat that I wanted yeah, to right be here. there. But again, it's but it's on the wrong side. Like <laughs> so, like it's not supposed to be on this side. It's supposed to be on the other side, technically speaking, right? So what mm -hmm. is going on here? Um, and so there's there's reasons. Um, there's some pretty cool world building that goes into that really mode and why it's dry shot right now. here too. Thank you. And um, that's just another guard who's like, dude, what are you doing here? Like, yeah, give him that because stink again, eye. It, 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 I, the military understands the military truce and they understand what they're looking at a little bit more than the common people when they look mm -hmm. at a Natu. They, they know where he's from because they've encountered Raukitas on their travels. Like, we don't know that this guy's always been garrisoned at this wall. Maybe so are they like feared or like revered? A little bit of both. Um, you know, gotcha. depending on who you, depending on where you are, you're going to have a different viewpoint, right? Mm -hmm. um, but a, definitely a little bit of both. So I think, again, you could say the same thing about the Navy SEALs, right? Uh, how, do, how, how does somebody somewhere in the world feel about the Navy SEALs? I think you're going to get a different answer. Depending yeah, on, depending on if, if, if you're the force is sending them or if you're the force is getting them. I get it. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I, I play that up as much as I can. Um, and so he's, you know, heading out. And again, this guy tanning leather right on the outskirts of town. I play Skyrim a lot. It's 